some dare call it conspiracy. Listeners and welcome to this crossover episode with the Condition Release Program and Some Dare Call It Conspiracy. I'm here with Brent Lee, who is the other half of Some Dare, an excellent podcast that I have come to know and love and is one of my favorite things to listen to. I always check the feed because it's always some great new little thing. Neil reads out a blog post and I'm just like, fuck, that is brilliant. It's uh, It feels <laughs> effortless, but it's absolutely not. And we'll probably bitch about that. But um Uh, We're going to talk about conspiracies and how utterly fucked in the head we have been over the course of time and maybe still a little bit fucked in the head. How are you doing, man? I'm good, man. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for uh, suggesting this little bit of a crossover. Yeah, I thought it would be really great. One of the things I wanted to start off with is the fact that we are going to be partnering with some episodes in the future which is cool. I'm going to come along for the ride for some of the deep dives you guys do, um, which I'm really looking forward to because basically, um, A, I love the sort of like the live nature of being a part of the podcast, but B, the research is just like sort of second to none. The camaraderie is awesome. You know, you have a beer and you listen to some of the most interesting le- sort of lectures uh, and it's just, it's just fantastic to be a part of something like that. So, um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to that. That's going to be really great. Yeah, that's right, man. Um, you are now officially our... A permanent guest (laughs) for deep dives, essentially. Um, Our travel companion. Yeah, exactly. We're going to have to tackle time zones, but. At the end of the day, like that Pizzagate series that we did was just perfect. It was so good. I I loved it. I was thinking, thinking, how can we make this perfect every time? Well, let's think of like the elements that it contained. And at the end of the day, mate, you were one of these elements. It was just so much fun going through it with you. Um, you had great perspective, brilliant sense Thanks, of humor. Man. We just all had fun. It was just good. And basically, you know, I just thought that would be badass. I spoke to Neil. I was like, hey, what do you think of this? And he was like, mate, I think that's a fucking brilliant idea. Brilliant. And here we I are. So I, I messaged you. What did I say to you? He's like, will you be our Jordan? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we'll be our Jordan, yeah. Yeah, I'm totally into it. It's going to be great because, like, it is really nice to be able to sort of go in there um, having not done the research yourself and having not done the footwork and just be like, have someone else blow my mind, um, which is really, really nice. Whereas, you know, I do find that, you know, my beautiful podcast host, Jack the Insider, will do true crime deep dives that I'll just be like, what the fuck? But when I research an episode, like the recent one of Sound and Freedom, I was just like, you know, doing the episode, you're like, I know all this stuff. I'm just recounting it. Whereas being a part of that, you can sort of sit there and be like, what the fuck? Like Pizzagate, man, that episode blew my mind. Anyone who hasn't listened to the Pizzagate episode has to listen to it. Absolutely. It's mandatory listening. Now, the next thing that I want to go into is the Some Dare title. So that's a play on a book title, right? Yeah. The book was None Dare Call It Conspiracy, which is by yeah. F. Gary Allen. Uh, it was released in the 70s. And basically, F. Gary Allen was a John Bircher. Ah, nice. Good, good bunch. And he kind of helped put a lot of the conspiracism points together in a very easily digestible book. Oh, good. That's that's poison. Basically, and it kind of helped really, yeah, helped really kind Popular of um, conspiracy theories, I guess, sp- spawn the 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 modern era essentially of conspiracism. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, every single like big influencer, like around the time when I started coming up, they everyone said like you have to listen to none their call it conspiracy or read the book or whatever. Um, and yeah, me and Neil were yep. just like kicking about some ideas basically. And Neil said, how about some dare call it conspiracy? <laughs> and I just was like, yeah, perfect. fantastic. I actually had that sort of idea myself. Oh, nice. Like, I thought that would have been a good title, but I kind of just dropped it and forgot and tried to move on. Great minds. And he brought it back and I was like, yeah, yeah, nice. Sounds, that's it. That's it. Some dare call it conspiracy. I had a, um, a train ride up to see my friend Isaac um, up north and the train ride's about eight hours and the mobile phone signals, they don't really work on the train, which is such a blessing because you're just there with like a notepad, whatever no. you brought, because <laughs> every now and then you get to a train station and you've got like 30 seconds to check your Twitter or your Facebook and that's it, which is really, really healthy. And I sat there with a notepad and basically wrote down the plan for the podcast and one of those things was just writing down 
potential names. And I wrote down just shitloads of random names. I've still got the notepad somewhere and just just reams of them. And I was going to give it to Jack and just basically say, okay, pick one. And I did. And one of them was the conditional release program. And I don't even know really why conditional release program came to my head, but I was listening to Conditions of My Parole by Pussifer. And I was like, Conditions of My Parole, conditional release program. Okay, yeah, I'm going to chuck that on there. And I didn't really think much of it because I did not think that was the one he was going to pick. Out of all these ones that I really liked way more than that one. And then he picked it and I was like, okay, okay, <laughs> weird choice. I'll go with it. And now looking back, I'm like, thank fucking Christ he picked that one. Man, like there were some real turds in that list. I thought that was great at the time. <laughs> it sticks out. It and sticks it's really out, doesn't easy it? to Google. Like yeah. um, that being said, it is funny because conditional release programs do exist in the US uh, for, so like you know, uh, bail and uh, you know, so parole and things like that. Because it is actually a thing, like a legal mechanism for um, releasing people back into society. And uh, it's pretty funny because there's like us ranting about conspiracy theories and pointing our finger. And then there's like these genuine rehabilitation programs in like fucking Utah and like, you know, Denver. And they're like, you know, we're, we're trying to really bring them back into the community. And then it's like fucking vaccines, man. So yeah, it's quite a contrast. So I think one of the things we want to open up with is basically pilled origin stories. And I think your one's been more interesting than mine. So I'm going to kick off um, because basically my one because, you know, I want to give some space to breathe. Um, mine was basically, as a kid, my mother was an, was an astrologer and we went to these uh, sort of psychic fairs and festivals around the place where she'd do charts and readings and things like that. She's friends with all the psychics and all the crystal sellers and all the Reiki healers and all the general sort of practitioners of all that sort of stuff. And I ran around these festivals and just sort of made friends. I mean, like we'd be there – somewhere in a rural setting for a weekend my dad would be doing the numerology my mum would be doing the astrology and i'd be running around hassling the psychics and trying to get freebies from stall holders and you know sort of buying a crystal for two dollars and finding out what it was meant to do to my chakras and shit and uh and it was <laughs> yeah. it was pretty interesting and like one of the stalls that was always there was the nexus nexus magazine new dawn magazine and australian listeners might know of it but the uk listeners might not know it's basically just a conspiracy magazine but it goes back fucking years it's like decades old and the editor duncan rhodes i think he had a crush on my mom i'm not 100 percent sure about that allegedly allegedly but he put us on a list and that list had a perpetual subscription to nexus and new dawn so it just arrived every now and then i just have a fresh pot of conspiracy theories. So basically that went straight to the toilet. And my dad also had a subscription to New Scientist, which is pretty funny. So I had a real contrast of uh, toilet reading. There was New Scientist <laughs> and there was Nexus Magazine. And uh, I got both sides. And by both sides, I mean I skimmed through these giant long articles about fucking aliens and weird gene sequencing in New Scientist. And I eventually got to the point where... I got pretty sus about things, you know, um, fluoride uh, in the water was always a big bugbear for me uh, and, you know, just general sort of political conspiracies. Big Pharma was definitely on the on the general shit list. So that's sort of like the way that I got sort of brought into it through that sort of new age pipeline, but it was always very progressive and one of the things that really turned me off later and we'll sort of, you know, skirt around that uh, as we go is the drift toward the right. You know, I was always the Michael Moore conspiracy theorist type that sort of left progressive uh you know we need better institutions because the politicians are corrupt and i also come from an atheistic sort of agnostic background so it's like when they bring god into it my eyes just fucking glaze over but that kind of pilledness was more just the fact that i you know believed in a few conspiracy theories i tended towards bottled water because i didn't trust the tap and there were a few other things, you know, looking in the sky and saying, oh, maybe there's some chemtrails and things. But you were fucked. I've seen, <laughs> I've seen your Twitter, man. You were <laughs> fucked. Give me your origin story because you were so cooked. I was. <laughs> I was like, I was as cooked as the Pizzagate QAnon people. Yeah. Yeah. Basically, like I always try and say, I'm I was proto Q. Oh shit! You know, if if you want to try to explain yeah, yeah, it, yeah, that's it, yeah. Um, but yeah, man, my my story goes back essentially to 2003 okay. when I kind of happened to come across some documentaries. Yep. I'm interested in documentaries. I'm interested in learning stuff. Figured out how to download it on Curiosity my internet. Killed the cat. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in it, <laughs> and, and I, I always kind of was like sort of into stuff. You know, you'd hear JFK, yep. or I'd watch a bit of X Files, yep. or any sort of things like that. But yeah, I, I downloaded these this folder, 
And uh, the first video I watched was called Millennium 2000. Millennium 2000. That's very and funny. It <laughs> feels like double handling there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and it was filmed in 1993. Okay. And it was about things that were supposed to happen around the millennium. Did they though? And I'm watching this in 2003 thinking, oh, this stuff's going to happen. Just like completely forget the <laughs> time. But anyway. Um, <laughs> it's a big requisite for being conspiracy theorists. In that, it had like... you got to forget those things. Uh, in that, it had like kind of stuff about like Freemasons nice, and the nice. Illuminati basically being the hidden yep. hand in um, mm-hmm. world politics and everything basically going on. Yep. And I thought it was kind of interesting. My stepdad is in the military and oh, okay. the Air Force, and I'd always heard him talk about the Masons. Oh, wow. And that they'd always ask him to join the Masons and stuff like that, but he was never into it. Um, so the kind of, you know, I, I, I it was familiar, but it wasn't anything that I really really got stuck into i just thought oh this is quite interesting oh, especially the stuff about dollar bill and the yeah, symbols on the yeah. back of it and things I was like it's cool it's yeah. interesting but it didn't really take hold of me quite at that time yeah the next videos i started to watch was 9 11 conspiracy videos loose change and stuff like that and those hooked me instantly well loose yeah. change came a bit later okay yeah okay interesting. so i think the, f- the first one i i watched might have been might have been called in plain sight interesting but i know another one well, of them was huh? called 911 illuminati oh spicy yeah yeah i didn't see yeah. any shit so and it kind of you know, it, it painted that picture of 9-11 being an inside job. Yep. They did the controlled demolitions yep. thing. They did the World Trade Center. Yep. They did uh, World Trade Center 7, sorry, a missile hinting the Pentagon, yep. all that kind of stuff. And the way they framed it, like I was just – I was instantly sold. It's very convincing. I was just like this – this is something I need to look into yeah. because they were also framing it as like this is the reason why we're going to war in Iraq. It made sense. Because it's 2003. And we were about to go to war there. Yep. And like in England, mate, we're like most people did not want to go. Oh, same with Australia. There was hundreds of thousands of yep. people on the street same saying here. we do not want to go to war yep. with Iraq. We all understood why we should go to Afghanistan and we should go get bin Laden yep. for what happened in 9-11 and we'd help America go do that. Yep. But moving on to the next one felt a bit weird. Yeah, it was a lot of reasons why And I didn't like it. Yeah. And I got to say, man, like again <laughs> – you know, it, it spoke to something in my childhood. Yeah, okay. The fear of going to war. Interesting. With Iraq. Yeah. Basically, as I said, my stepdad was in the military, in the Air Force. Yeah. But my first stepfather was a Marine in Vietnam. Interesting. Yeah, that wasn't fun. And he had the worst time. Yeah. I had a sh- – it, sh- it was a shit, shit, like, first, like, six years of my life, like, Fuck. with him. And it's – and now as an adult, like, I don't blame him. Yeah, 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 yeah. He had PTSD. He it. had night terrors. He drank. He beat my mom to nearly half to death. Fuck. Like, he got sent back to America because of it. And it was wow. it was fucked. And then we were, like, abandoned in Germany and shit. So I saw these, this, the scars, basically, of war yeah. on him. Fuck. And so then eventually like a few years later my mom meets a different guy they get married and this guy is like the kindest like the the rock in my life yeah, you know cool. like it was like a father Sounds figure like that was right it. there for me yeah he was he was he was amazing and you know the early 90s rolled around and he was going to get called to go to the gulf war oh, no. in Kuwait. and i was like about i don't know 11 or 12 or something yeah, like that and i that. was shit scared yeah because i just thought like fuck Either he's going to go there and die, yeah. or he's going to come back and be like Ramon, yeah. my first stepfather. Yeah. So it's like all this kind of shit in my head of like, uh. so I was just kind of, he didn't end up going, Good. which was you know a blessing, yeah. but still like you see it all happen. And that really formed my teenage years of going away from the government and the military yeah. and really hating war and all of that kind of shit, basically. Yeah. So 2003 rolls around. I'm not into this going to Iraq. They want to, you know, send more people. To, I, I, yeah. So I thought, yeah, this is a pretext yeah. to go there. It's an excuse to go to war. You know, so it sold it money. to me. And then I needed to find out who these people were then. Yeah. Carlisle group. You know, why did they do it? All that sort of stuff. Yeah. yeah. And then you start getting in back into the secret society stuff. Yep. Yep. So I was like, oh, shit, maybe I should go back to that Millennium 2000 thing. Yep. And have a little watch of that. Skull and Bones. And Yale. then you get into the Freemasons, Illuminati, Scale, Skull and Bones, yep. Yep, all that shit. 322, all that shit. And then you're kind of looking at, 
looking at who else is talking about this stuff. Yep. Because I only can have seen this Jordan Maxwell and Alex Jones. Yeah, Alex Jones. Talk about it. So yeah. I'm like kind of Googling, trying to find other people. It's a gateway and I come drug. across um, David Icke. Yeah, okay. I never you know, got into him. Interesting. But it's a UK thing, I yeah, suppose. Yeah. And I, I, yeah. So I just started listening to all that kind of stuff. The, the guy that I actually downloaded the first folder off of as well, he had tons, there's tons of like truth or stuff. Yep, yep, yep. So I sent him a message and was like, how do I get hold of more of this stuff? Oh, shit. You're like a junkie. <laughs> on, on DC. Yeah, because we were on DC++. It was oh, a peer-to-peer. DC++. Um, yeah, thing. Direct Connect. Fuck. Yeah. You are taking me yeah, back. Yeah, back in the day. Um, and he was like, hey, yeah, no problem. Um, there's a private hub that I'm a part of. Yep. I can get you an invite and we can get you That's in there. So shady. I went in there and, oh, my God, there was just like, there's probably about 100 people maybe. Yeah. But they had thousands of documentaries, yeah, podcasts, yeah. radio recordings, PDFs, doc files, yeah. just everything you wanted. It was all over the place. That's um, so interesting. And I was just downloading and downloading and downloading loads of crap and just kept consuming and consuming and consuming more and more and more. And just like felt like I had opened up to this whole new world I hadn't heard of. Yeah. Yeah. It's like a parallel universe. No. Yeah. Not that all of what I was coming across I felt was true, yeah. but it was just all right there. And uh, where do we go from there, man? Because eventually I do start to like kind of believe the usual sort of um, every terror attack is a ritual. Yeah, all oh, ritual. Uh, I'd go false doing flag. this yep. for Satan. Wow. Fuck, all that type that's of thing. very deep. You know? I mean, like I did – on the morning of 9-11, I came to school. I was about 15. I was in year 10. And I basically didn't really know what to think, but I knew that I didn't trust the narrative. And I was watching because the news was on TV all day and all that sort of stuff. And I came to school and my original thinks, I was very anti-American um, for much less um, interesting and nuanced reasons than you had and more just because I was a, a little shit. Um, and uh, I just basically was just like, <laughs> fucking Americans, they've had this fucking coming for years. It's going to be one of like 10 different people because let's face it, they pissed off the entire world, you know, with all these fucking, you know, bombings and things like that and fucking with South America and fucking with Cuba and blah, blah, blah. You know, like they brought this upon themselves. It's their own fault, blah, blah, blah. And my mate Isaac, he's American by birth, and he was just a bit like, mate, I can't be near you right now. And we're very good friends, like best mates. And he's like, mate, I just can't, I can't be near you, you know, like this, this is too much. You've, you've gone a little bit over the line. And of course, my response to that was, <laughs> yeah. well, fuck you then, suck my dick. Um, and, uh, you know, it, just looking back, I just cringe so hard. It's my reaction to it, you know. People died, but when you get sort of peeled into this, like, you know, yeah. sort of political sphere, very opposite to your situation where everything was seriously, like, there was trauma in there, but it was also based on empathy and humanity. Mine was ultra-political and devoid of humanity. You know, these people who were jumping out of yeah. a skyscraper were, to me, just like pawns in a game. And that, oh, man, looking back, and I was like, you know, fuck, was it the Palestinians? Was, was it the Middle East? Who was it? What's going on? I thought it was Palestinians at first, and I got really, really charged off about that. I was just throwing theories into the air, and I'm talking like, you know, by hour, I'm just sort of like, you know, basically spinning shit to mm -hmm. And then eventually the sort of narrative landed, and I'm like, fucking bullshit, you know, and then I was looking for a reason to not believe it. You know, I'm looking for something, yeah. and then I eventually yeah. found it. Um, and that's the thing I talk about a lot these days, which I've sort of discovered through modern conspiracy theories is an addiction to counter narratives and the, mm. um, the need for there to be something that is not the mainstream line because the mainstream line has to be wrong because it is the mainstream line. Yeah. You were just 15 though at the time, you know, like, yeah, I was a kid. You didn't really know what was going on. Well, that's it. I was 22. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I was 22. I was, um, I was staying with my mum. I always thought this was important, right? But it's just coincidences and all that. But later I would come to think this was a monumentous day. Okay. Yeah. It was the day that I got my PC oh. that I had bought, like, off of my own money to start music production. Ah, oh, nice. And doing my rapping and everything. So it's like th that day, like, my music career was born. Yeah. But it was also when that happened yeah 9 11 happens right so yeah. my mum comes up and knocks on the door while i'm putting my, my my pc together and she's like oh my god have you seen what's happened i was like no what she's like 
something's happened to the World Trade Center. So I came down and had a look. And obviously one building, the smoke's coming out. Yeah. And we're sat there going, God, what what happened? Yeah. Did was it a pilot? Was he drunk? Yeah. Like you're thinking all these things. You're not even thinking that it's a terrorist attack at all. Because you don't know. And, and like no one as we're sat chatting, talking about it, trying to figure out what happened, we see the second plane coming. Come yeah. Yeah. We <sighs> watch it hit. And we're like, that was, so was that a replay of what happened? Yeah. No, that's the other one. Is the other one is still on? Oh my god, this is live! Yeah. Holy, sh- oh, this is this is intentional. This is intentional. Yeah. My mom's like, oh my god, this is they've someone's planned to do this. And she went, who would do such a thing? And I just looked straight at her and went, Osama bin Laden. What? Before the news even said it, interesting. And she's like, "Who's that?" I was like, "Oh, he's a terrorist who who's in Afghanistan. Basically, he bombed the USS Cole six months ago, and two years bef- and a year or so before that, he bombed two embassies in Africa. Wow. He's like, he's had it in for for these guys for America for ages. I'm pretty sure he's sort of connected to the 1993 World Trade Center, yeah. Center bombing. Interesting. And she's like, "Oh, really?" I said, "Yeah." So this has definitely got to be him. Wow. You know, and I knew at the time that it was him because I was interested in geopolitics. I was yeah. interested in Islamic terrorism and terrorism all around the world. Interesting. Again, because of my background of growing up in the military, yeah. we were always made to be aware of terrorist threats. Interesting. We had a terror we had a threat level on the base like every day before you went in. Of course. There was like yeah. a big sign that said how high the terrorist level was. Yeah. Our base got attacked by by left wing terrorists interesting they they honey potted a man they killed him wow they took his id they took his car and they drove the car onto the base Shit. and they blew it up and killed i think one or two airmen wow. when i was like six or seven years old and i heard the fucking bomb blast from like three miles away Jesus. like we all heard it and it was just like so it's something that's always been there so i've always like really kept a keen eye on that yeah full on that's so interesting so and I, so it's kind of weird that I kind of fell into the conspiracy stuff. But when they were able to talk about like Osama receiving CIA money yep. and all this sort of stuff, then it all kind of started to make sense to me. I was like, oh, right. Yeah. You start getting There's answers. a whole hidden picture that I wasn't seeing. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes there aren't answers, but, yeah. but you were getting answers and that felt good. But it makes yeah. sense. You know, like, oh, that's really, yeah, it's very fucking interesting. Like with the 9 11 in Australia, on the flip side of that, so the way I found out about 9-11 was because I got up and I went to the bathroom and dad had a little TV in his room and it was on and the news was on and I think he was asleep. And I'm like, why the fuck are you watching the news at like 7 a.m.? What the <laughs> fuck are you doing? And um, so I sort of went in there. And I was like, oh, something funky's happening because that tower is smoking But I think at this point, um, both planes had gone in there. I think Tower 7 hadn't fallen yet, blah, blah, blah. But it was much further along because we had that. I'm not, I, can't, I don't actually know what the time was, but it was sometimes sort of like, you know, 3 a.m. sort of stuff. So I think very few people in Australia would have actually seen it live like you did um, and had those moments mm. of like, you know, fuck what's happening, holy shit, all that happened type stuff. But, um, but yeah, it was a very fucking interesting morning, but that is – it's fascinating. I was awake for like the next week. Yeah. For the whole next week. I was just watching TV the whole time, 24-7, just watching it, watching it, watching it, yeah. waiting for new developments. Yeah. Great for ratings. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> this is the thing that I thought we should do today, which is basically what I'm going to steal from Dan Schreiber is the batshit list. He's got a new podcast out, We Could Be Weirdos, and he gets his guests and he brings out a list of things that they may or may not believe in and goes through it with them. He recently did it with Dan Aykroyd, which is amazing. And basically, Dan Aykroyd believed in fucking everything because he's totally nuts and great. <laughs> I love that he's nuts. I think he's a beautiful kind of nuts, not like a vicious, venomous, awful kind of nuts. Um, but yeah. I figure that uh, we'll start off going back in time and let's let's look at JFK. What did you think about JFK? Like, yeah. Did you think about JFK much? Did you look into JFK much? Mate, I, I looked into it in many, many different ways. <laughs> That's the thing with this is I'm going to be able to like tell you like two or three different beliefs that I held over the 15 years. Yep. Yep. And that's what I'm here for, you man. Because it, it, did, it did swap and change. Obviously, beforehand, before I f- fell down the rabbit hole, I, I thought, you know, yeah, JFK was killed by someone on the grassy knoll. Yeah, you know, it, it wasn't. 
Lee Harvey Oswald, we watched the movie, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. I mean, it's just kind of a given. Yeah. yeah. You know? And then I think the most popular theory that I gelled with was the William Cooper theory of it being the driver. Yeah, okay. That's interesting. When the driver like reaches behind his uh turns behind his shoulder. Oh wow. And you can see like his hand go like that. I doubt and it looks like there's a gun there. And just as he uh, just as he like goes like that, JFK's like head goes back. Yeah, okay. Interesting. I've I've debunked it now. I know I now I know what is going on at that point. But I didn't but that was the, the 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 seller for me for a long time also that it was a part of a ritual yeah because it happens in Dealey plaza and the road is laid out like a pyramid with the capstone oh, missing for fuck's sake <laughs> <laughs> and you can blame david ike for that one because yeah. that is in the biggest secret by david ike. okay well done him and that's where i start coming into the ritualistic elements oh, of everything man, that's so much more um, i still don't know what happened well i gotta right. say i don't know what happened yeah, like i'm like that too we gotta do a deep dive on it yeah okay um, i'd love that you know we do have to figure that one out because mm. I, I know Neil. Neil, I'm pretty sure Neil thinks it was the mafia. The mafia, and that there was a person in the in the manhole or something in the sewers. Yeah, okay, that's interesting because yeah. there's the cooked I, side of like you know, I, I don't know he was going to take on the Federal Reserve apparently, and the Federal Reserve yeah, decided yeah, yeah. like you know you can't do that. Um, but that sort of sounds like bullshit. I don't know. I remember that being the sort of basis for me. Ooh, ooh. I remember, I remember another one. Sorry. Oh, good. No, no, good. Give me, <laughs> give me, give me. George, George Bush, George Bush Sr. Yeah. Was in charge of the operation that day. Okay. Was he, so he was working in the sort of CIA or? Because he was CIA, yeah. At that time. Okay. Cool. Yeah. God, he had a long and that career. Was, and that job got him the, pres- the um, presidency of uh, CIA or whatever it's called, the head of that. Okay. Interesting. Because there's a, there's a uh, documentary, it's like, I hate to drop names of all these things, no, but go hey, it. go research it, figure it out, go listen to it. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, the Bush JFK connection, I think. Yeah, it's called. that rings a bell, actually. Interesting. Yeah, and it was it was fascinating to me. I was like, yeah, I think Bush did this. Yeah, <laughs> Bush is part of it because, like, well, at the end of the day, I did think that these were all well. They made the links uh, all in on it. Yeah, well, that's exactly. Yeah. It ends up being the thing of like it's all in on it. You almost got to like so, save some space for them. It's like, yeah, so I've saved a seat for Hillary Clinton over here, and I've got a seat for George Soros over here because you know Clash Schwab's got to sit <laughs> yeah. in front because you've all you got to get the whole gang involved. Now Fauci's involved in goddamn well fucking everything. Neil, I never really got too much into yeah. um, JFK Jr. sort of thing. Bill Hicks um, was one of the things that sort of pushed me toward the sort of appealing, that, you know, sort of <laughs> back and to the left. Back and to the left. Yeah, back and to the, yeah. And like, you know, I know those, you know, some three-minute videos of Bill Hicks that you'd watch back on your shitty internet um, back in the day. And Bill Hicks was brilliant. And look, like you say, like we still don't really know what happened as such. I think it's gross how RFK Jr. is using this whole my uncle, my uncle, my uncle shit, I'm trying to basically use yeah. this as a, as a weapon against the US establishment. Not that the US establishment is exactly a noble fucking outfit, but the cynical way that he's using it to push a right-wing anti-government agenda um, under the guise of being a Kennedy Democrat. I mean, fuck you, man. Do you think your uncle really wanted you to be using his name like this? I'm just going to say no. I'm just going to say no, champion. So, fuck RFK Jr. I'll say no. You know, he can eat shit. Yep. Now, not too far around the corner is the classic moon landing. Did it happen? Oh, yeah. Did we land on the moon? Probably. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> My mate Isaac thinks we didn't. <laughs> Where did Sorry, you Isaac. go with it, though? Where did you go with it? I never really bothered. It was a similar thing with JFK, and I think it was um, a lot to do with the sort of like my, the timing of my experience is the fact that the older stuff was more like a, it was sort of like a boring black and white movie to me. Um, the whole idea that Stanley Kubrick was producing something and the flag and stuff like that, but generally speaking, I didn't believe that um, that they landed on the moon. And I didn't really bother to find out why. But one of the things that I find incredibly funny about this, and mentioning Dan Schreiber, he's a big fan of Buzz Aldrin. I think he's met him a couple of times now. Um, and I think he even interviewed him at one point. Either way, um, Buzz Aldrin being a sort of big astronaut slash military type guy, people will come up and be like, you didn't land on the moon. He's just like, I'm going to punch you in the face now. Like he punches people who like <laughs> challenge him going on the moon. Yeah. I find that to be... Really funny because he's like, you know what? I can't argue with you. you you're pilled. There's no point in engaging <laughs> with you constructively. I'm just going to hit you, which isn't – violence isn't the answer. But when it comes to Buzz Aldrin, I find it really, really funny. And I think he's kept, continued to do it into like his 80s and 90s. It's just like, ah, 
I find it funny now. <laughs> I find it funny now. I didn't find it funny as a truther. Really? Interesting. I thought, see, he's been pushed. Yeah. He's been pushed to the edge. He's been triggered. He can't can't hold it. He can't hold his cool. Yeah, yeah. Because he obviously didn't. Well, you know, it's a good narrative. That's, that's kind of, you know. Yeah. It, um, I would double down with that. It's always a twist of it. Isn't yeah, it? exactly. So how, what did yeah. you think about the moon landing? I'm guessing you got a few PDS on this. <laughs> <laughs> From yeah. your direct connect group. <laughs> We did all the usual, like you said, the flags and the uh, the crosshairs on the photos yeah. and all that sort of stuff. But I used to kind of think, hey, look, don't even need to go that far, mate. We can't get past the Van Allen belt. What are you on about? Yeah, we can't get that past thing, the radiation, the radiation so thing, fuck yeah. it. It's all bullshit. Yeah. That's in the documentary. You know, so I, I did think it was – I did all believe like it's just garbage. And then the Kubrick thing came along. Yeah. And I, as I was so enthralled by – symbolism and yep. hidden messages in all this stuff I, that's all i spent most of my time doing that that is so all the funny. time so when someone came along with the shining thing and showing you know the kid just getting up off the floor and walking that many steps to the door and i was just like yeah it's kubrick he's, yeah. he's gone he's onto it he's onto it and then it just went through to it went through all of the jay widener research and was like yeah dude dude's got it yeah he, he knows he sussed it out it was kubrick kubrick is telling us that that's what he did interesting and, and that's really where i was yeah kind of like you didn't have to put too much thought into it yeah i guess so yeah is it kind of a given yeah and it's low consequence as well like you know harking back to the um the idea of like you know going to war with iraq and the sort of 9-11 flashpoint type thing which is where I really sort of started being like paying more attention to this sort of stuff. It did have those sort of real world consequences. And that's the thing with the QAnon conspiracy theory now being participatory. Um, but that's happening in real time. Yeah. Um, whereas before with 9-11, it was always a sort of like a, a general sort of rear view mirror thing where like the Iraq will be happening. You'd be like, I think this is pretty sus. And then you'd look back and you'd be like, okay, so these this money went to Halliburton and this happened here and this happened here and these people were involved. Whereas, of course, with QAnon, you've got some asshole being like, I know what's happening next and, you know, and we can prevent it. We can, you know, we can interfere with this and, and blah, 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 which is fucking terrible and fucking dangerous. Bad, bad. I'm so glad that didn't exist when I was a kid. My God, I'd be in prison. <laughs> so, so let's move on to what is now a hot topic, but, uh, but in the rear view mirror, Area 51, Roswell and aliens as a general concept. Little green men. How'd you go with that? Ooh, <laughs> um, God, which, which, where do we start with this one? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. All right. You are unelectable after this podcast. <laughs> oh, yeah, I, mate. <laughs> just, just go look at my x feed oh, no. and, you'll, and i'm unelectable oh man that sounds fun <laughs> um roswell yeah let's go let's go let's there shall we New Mexico. roswell pitch a tent i never thought that this alien government sort of narrative was a thing okay that you know aliens came here at some point crashed yep. and we got their technology or anything like yeah. that because the thing they're doing now i believed I believed in ancient aliens. Ah, you went old school. Nice. <laughs> so, those, that, so those fuckers have been around for 6,000 years. Of course. They didn't just turn up in the 40s. No, no. You know what I mean? So that's what, that's what I thought. That's more believable, to be honest. I mean, like that sounds like it's got more substance to it than <laughs> fucking little green men in Roswell yeah. nicking their little space lasers. Eventually, I became religious, and they were no longer aliens, and they ah, were fallen angels. Oh, and cool. That's fun. The greys were demons, and uh, well, well. the reptilians were seraphim okay and and basically all the rate the alien races. races were all part of pleiadians and all yeah. that yeah yeah all of them yeah. so they're all part of the different um the fallen angels that are demons or the nice. jinn. okay that would we're here basically that's kind of that's where i sort of did you ever think that's where i landed were you ever a star seed did you go that far uh no i think most people say um, they're star seeds i did look into quite a bit of stuff yeah, I went. I went to. I had a look at quite a lot of that stuff. I mate during two thousand three to two thousand eight. I went everywhere. Yeah, I looked everywhere. I went to mosques. I went to what at churches. I went to all different types of churches, like yeah. in Peterborough where I used to live, and I'd stop and speak to Jehovah's Witnesses. I, I the Mormons on the streets. I would talk to anyone and everyone that had 
some sort of idea either about the angels yeah. or what their their version of Jesus was. Interesting. Like these are things that really spoke to me. Wow. I went quite all over the place, and that's kind of where I started to think that a lot of these things were basically interdimensional. Yeah, okay. If you could say it in that sort of way. So yeah, less about moons and planets, and not actually. Yeah, yeah, not actual aliens. Aliens. Interesting. You like one up the alien theory, and just like went, <laughs> no, nah, not enough. No, nah, I need this to be more deranged and cooked. Absolutely. That's great. How do you stand with the religion now? Um, are you still a believer? I am. I'm still yeah. a believer, but I'm not a extremist as I was. Yeah, okay. I, be- I think like my problem is is that I started to feed into religious extremism essentially, like the belief. Yeah that a religious extremists have yeah you know, yeah it, they've taken it way too far the fundamentalists all that sort of thing and i even looked into mate. i even looked into like young earth creationism for a while yeah wow you yeah know? and just like really sat back and listened and tried to see if that worked yeah okay um, but yeah i am still i'm still i'm still christian yeah like but i don't like think that you know everyone who isn't a christian is fucked like, yeah. I don't think anything yeah. like that. I don't. I don't. I don't look at the Bible as the inerrant word of God. I look yeah. at it as sixty-six books written by forty different authors, all yep. expressing their different view or yep. experience or whatever poetry yep. about what they class as the divine. Yeah. Um, yep. So I don't really look at it like that anymore. Yeah. I have like this personal relationship with what I call the divine yep. and the the journey like looking for the divine yeah like i found my path through the wisdom of jesus interesting yeah so that's kind of why i call myself christian and yeah and i like i said i don't feel like (laughs) i I think everyone's going to the good place essentially yeah Yeah. unless you're terrible and then you just will cease to exist yeah that's my my personal belief like i don't believe in a hell type thing yeah yeah don't believe in any of that kind of thing i think you just poof gone um, yeah okay cool you don't get to have an afterlife which is um yeah, yeah that's, that's legit and like you know but when that, it comes yeah it took a while to get to there mate it took a while to get to there and getting to there helped me stop believing in the antichrist stop believing yeah. that lucifer was right. like important or running this world to stop me believing in the sacrifices all yeah. that kind of stuff because the i ritual. was just like yeah actually like he doesn't run this world no, like, humans are here to run this world. Yeah, like, he yeah. he doesn't. So, and in the image of, and that's it. Yeah. Really pulled me away from the extremist conspiracy stuff. Interesting. By learning these different things, no hell, no antichrist. Yeah, no rapture. Yeah, none of these things are actually happening. They're like a they're a twisted version of what is even in the text. Yeah, and it's all really new. It's all stuff that's been coming out for the like not even a hundred years a lot of this stuff yeah it's just people implanting their ideas in things and basically you know and and that's blasphemy in itself um but yeah like you know my my idea of jesus i've got that sort of agnostic atheistic thing where i like you know basically i've done enough philosophy classes to know that it's very arrogant to say that you know there isn't a god and that's what atheism is saying i know there's no god well no you fucking don't but i'm an agnostic (laughs) who leans toward the idea that there is nothing blah 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 you know a bit nihilistic but when it comes to jesus whether jesus walked the earth or not jesus as a concept has been really bastardized and the sort of sandal wearing socialist jesus that i picture and consider to be all welcoming all loving you know accept everyone for who they are it's crazy to look at modern christianity and see that somehow they took that guy and went okay yeah but mm-hmm. let's make him homophobic huh <laughs> what what no no wrong wrong turn no no turn the car off get out Go to a hotel and have a sleep because you're not, you're drunk. You're just not, it's not working for you, mate. So yeah, that's, you know, that's my very basic take. And let's make him white. Yeah. But like, you know, your, your journey was way more involved than mine. Shit. I, you know, I got an exemption from, um, from scripture when we we're in school. Uh, I just got my parents to write me a note, but it wasn't necessarily, I was definitely very edgy and like, you know, folk religion when I was younger, uh, I'm much more tolerant now, mostly from my philosophy teacher, to be honest. Carrie Sanders, amazing woman. She taught me religious um, sort of empathy, which is really cool. Uh, but yeah, I got but I got an exemption just because you got to hang out in the library and chat with your mates. And I just thought that was cool. I could get out of class. 
and um, you know, and I asked <laughs> yeah. out one of the girls in, yeah. in the in the group. Like it was fucking great. Um, but in year six, like what is asking someone out? Like we didn't even kiss. Whatever. I was like fucking twelve. Anyway, massive sidebar. Let's move on to anti-vaccine sentiment. Were you vaccinated as a mm. child? I can say quite proudly, I was not, because my mum thought that vaccines were poison. <laughs> I just didn't get jabbed. And that's why you. <laughs> and what? That's why you caught polio. Or well, I fuck, I probably should have. Like, I never got measles, but measles didn't <laughs> exist back then. You know, like they had uh, German measles and shit. Yeah. I was never vaccinated for it, though. Yeah. I got a blood test because I wasn't actually sure. And I couldn't really ask my mum because we're not in exactly great terms these days. So I basically went to the doctor and he did a blood test um, because he's like, dude, measles is coming back. Are you vaccinated? I'm like, I don't think I am. And he gives a blood test. He's like, <laughs> no, you're not. I don't think you've ever had a jab. So, you know, could you do that, please? I'm like, yeah, sure. And like, not because I'm anti vax, because I'm useless. I only got like two of the three or whatever. And I just didn't, like, I forgot to go back. You got measles mumps, but no rubella. Yeah, it's a bit like that. Like, you know, <laughs> I don't know what the impact of that is, but I sort of ticked a box and sort of moved on. But um, I'll just avoid people that look like they have measles. I don't know what that really means, though. But, um, but yeah, I mean, like, uh, being around military bases and stuff, wouldn't jabs have been mandatory? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, so you that's the thing. Yeah. Like that's what I've got today. Like when I'm when I'm thinking about like people who uh work for the government and that like that's where mandates come in. Yeah. Like that you have to be vaccinated and mandated that vaccines need to be mandated in in government jobs. Like that's yeah. that's how it is. Yeah. That's how I've grown up. Yeah. It's probably why I don't have a problem with IDs either. Yeah, yeah, like, cuz you've always <laughs> had no problem with an ID cuz yeah. I've carried one all my life yeah. like well they're they're handy. Yeah. You know. <laughs> yeah. Um but yeah, we had vaccination and then that period where, like, we were abandoned in Germany, where my first yeah. stepdad left, and yeah. before we met my second stepdad, I was enrolled into German school. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. And again, their health care was amazing. Yep. And yeah, you got everything that you needed. Just got jabbed. Yeah. yeah just take it. I got exemptions. <laughs> People like lined up for the tetanus shot. I think this was like a maybe like sort of year 10 or year 11. So around that sort of September 11 time when I started really getting pot killed. And uh, not only did I get an exemption, well, I didn't get an exemption. I didn't come with a um, permission slip. I just didn't get it signed. I don't even think I told my parents about it. And uh, <laughs> and basically I stood there and I taunted people getting vaccinated. And um, one person got like a lump in their arm, you know, like a, a tennis ball, a uh, kid named Tom Howes, who's now a cop. Um, he had this big <laughs> lump in his arm and I was like, look at that fuckwit. Look, see, they put poison in your arm and it gets swelled up. What did you expect to happen, mate? And it's like, what a cunt. I mean, I'm so lucky that some of these people still talk to me because like I was such a prick. <laughs> Imagine being a fucking little teenager. Imagine being a teacher and watching this squeaky little fucking kid, pimply faced yeah. fucking dick shit it just thinks he's an adult going oh you're getting injected with poison you're all just shields for big pharma you're just here to make drug companies money <laughs> they're all you know you're just getting poisoned by the government and you just be like shut up kids i mean someone should- yeah she probably blamed your mum. well my mum very much instilled these ideas with me and this was the thing like basically the explanation for anti-vaccine sentiment was simple it's a money maker um which is not yeah, of course, vaccines don't make money. Um, treatments do, and that's my other sort of uh, big pharma thing that we'll sort of segue into. But um, but it was definitely the idea of it's a very basic thing. I didn't really need to know the ins and outs of why and what. I didn't in read Reams information. It was basically just big pharma are very suspect, and they're jabbing kids at school to basically just sell product, and that was that was all there was to it. Polio, measles, all the intricate parts of that. Really, just no. But even into my 20s, I was like, I'm not fucking jabbing poison into my fucking arm. What are you, crazy? That's just fucking big farmer making money. And like, you know, I don't know what the fuck's in that. Like, And it's just no basis. It wasn't smart analysis. It wasn't clever critique. It was just big farmer's bad and I don't trust it. Cool. <laughs> Great work. It wasn't being smart. No, it wasn't. It was being, being smart. a smart ass. Yes, it was. It hundred percent was. And then eventually, um, with the whole sort of like you know, the measles thing, I also got um, I stabbed myself in the hand, and um, and I got a D tap, which is like you know the um, diphtheria, tetanus, and uh, pertussis one, and um, and it was like the first one I'd ever had. And they're like, "Have you had a tetanus shot?" I'm like, "No." They're like, "Oh, when was your last one?" I'm like, "Never, ever." 
give me one. I stabbed myself with a dirty knife. <laughs> Please just do whatever you're going to do. <laughs> but it wasn't necessarily out of the fact that I was still anti-vaccine. I just hadn't had the opportunity. Um, but in my early 20s, the idea of getting a DTAP, I'd be like, oh, I'm sorry. Do you want me to be autistic? Because I don't really want to be autistic. So that'd be cool. Thanks, guys. Yeah, I, I used to think it was um, going to, you know, as part of the depopulation plan. Yep. Yeah, that's a classic. Like, I thought it was. We like that one. I did think, like, we, we talk about it in the Chemtrails episode that's coming up. Like, I used to think that there was a soft kill depopulation plan. Yep. Yep. And it was being put in the food, it was the chemtrails, yep. it was the vaccines, it was yep. everything kind of around us. And the more you consume to these things, the quicker you'll die. Yep. Yeah. You know, everything and but cigarettes. That's how, <laughs> that's how everyone else, like, even the elites can be exposed to this because they're only taking in the chemtrails or something, uh, but they're yeah. not doing the fluoride in the water. They're not taking they're the vaccines, not doing the, the other Pellegrino. combination of stuff. Yeah. 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 That's it. Yeah. You know, that's, that's why I, I did, I did think, um, and you know, I also did think one day they're going to vaccinate the uh, entire globe and they're going to put microchips in. Well, I did think that that's what was going to happen. You were leading up to a perfect there point. I am stuck. <laughs> <laughs> Here we are. Well, my one's buzzing. Um, I, I, we, had, we had some computer issues earlier, and um, I had some computer issues last night with the Zoom with the patrons for the conspiracy uh, the condition release program. Fuck me. And it's great because <laughs> um, Soz from Tim Fall Tales, which is so like a, a partner podcast of ours, she was saying, oh, well, you're over the target. And that's what they think. You know, if there's any kind of technical issues or anything like that, they're just like, oh, fuck, you know, they're, they're censoring us. But they also think that they've got fucking Bluetooth chips in their arms. I guess they must be listening to things. So it's like, you know, oh, shit, my microchip just said to the government that I was talking about something that's too too true. And, you know, and they've like cut my internet off. It's like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, all right, mate, good work. So anyway, that's a massive detour. <laughs> um, let's hit up Big Pharma, one of my favorites. It's a classic, you know. It's like the Beatles of conspiracy theories to me. It um, really ties the room together. Some really good albums, a few weird ones, but generally speaking, if you're going to be a conspiracy theorist, <laughs> you've got to distrust Big Pharma, even if you've like had an experience with Big Pharma that's like literally saved your life. You still have to hate Big Pharma in a really weird and irrational kind of sense. I think it's kind of like um, like when you have to hate major record labels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because they are bastards. It's like that kind of thing. It's like I like I like the music. Yeah. But like you know, major record labels are they they, they destroy the true art. Yeah, and that's kind of the pharma they yeah. can destroy. It's a very like good our analogy. health. Yeah, it's- and like you know, the the record labels basically you know they'll push as much sort of um, saccharine candy type stuff to the to the masses to uh, you know uh, placate us all, blah blah blah, and make as much money as possible. I never really yeah. got into the idea that, uh, you know, the record companies were intentionally trying to sort of fuck with us through what they release, which is this sort of like Disney bent that's happening now, you know, this woke Disney sort of weird protest shit. Like Disney's <laughs> ever been a good company. I mean, like they are not your friend. I know, right. But, um, but yeah, like with Big Pharma, I think it's interesting insofar as the, like the, the entry for me is anti-capitalism. Um, you know, I'm still left of center, but I was like, you know, no, not necessarily like, you know, sort of communist because I wasn't smart enough to be communist because I didn't really understand the concepts behind it, but I just was anti-capitalism and I wasn't quite sure how to articulate that. And then I got a degree in political economy and I understood why capitalism was a little bit flawed. And, uh, that took me several years and, uh, I have now a cool diploma to show for that. But generally speaking, the big farmer, like I say, with like the vaccines and things, it was about profit. And the idea that what they'll do is they'll get together in a big room and they'll say, oh, we've got a cure for cancer. Oh, but we have a treatment for cancer. Well, we'll shelve the cure for cancer and we'll put out the treatment yeah. because the cure for cancer is going to be a one-off thing, like a vaccine, ironically, yeah. which in my head was a big moneymaker. I mean, come on, you can see how this like falls apart immediately. Um, but the treatment is going to make more money. And look, there's arguments for and against this because I do think that there is – a, a real problem with profit motives and pharmaceutical care. But one of the interesting things, especially around vaccines, is that a lot of the stuff that big pharma rely on is university research. And if you think that universities are covering up cures for profit, then you've got fucking rocks in your head. Mm, yeah, totally. So where did you go with your PDFs and direct connect on uh, on big pharma? Where did you go? Like, did you, get, did you get religious with that as well? Like, you know, big pharma's run by fucking Satan or... Hey, everything was run by these people. 
Everything, every single thing was run yeah. by these people, especially pharmaceuticals. Like at the end of the day, what's what's the symbol? What's the symbol for pharmacies and everything? Uh, yeah, a yeah, snake yeah, wrapped yeah. around With his staff, staff. You know what snake. I mean? Like, yeah, that's been them yeah. from day one, like pumping us full of yeah, stuff that yeah. causes dis ease in our bodies. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you sound like Pete Evans. Thanks, thanks again to David yeah, Ike for that one. One hundred percent. Oh uh, yeah, that's that's a that's a glanger. I like it. Well done, Dave. Um, yeah, but that's that was it. It's like. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, it's a given to to uh, to uh, when you're a conspiracist, certain things are just a given. Yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. Of course, I, I, yeah. pharmaceuticals are f- fucking us over. Yeah, of course, the yeah. CCTVs are watching us. Yeah, of course, this is tracking us. Of course, this is it's just a very much of course. It's a truthism. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah, and it really is. It's a it's a real sort of bread and butter of the of the whole general thing. But it's so funny, like I say, you know, when it comes to big pharma, it's like, you know, big pharma evil until they save your life. And then they're evil again once you get back on the on the thing. You're like, you know, oh, yeah, no, yeah. You, you, you guys aren't so bad. No, you are bad. Yeah. <laughs> I find it all really funny about Pfizer, to be honest, because you know yeah. loads of these people were taking blue dick pills. Oh, yeah. Before oh, the, yeah. the jab. And they Loving were it. counting on it. Yeah. I've got a yeah. great clip, right? There's a guy over here. Oh, I can't even remember his name, Peter or something. He runs a thing called New Culture Forum out of 55 Tufton Street. It's one of these stupid fucking right wing oil conservative um, uh, okay. think yeah, tanks. Yeah, think tanks. Yeah. yeah right. Yeah. And he's got a, a video of like the greatest um, achievements of British companies or british people or the best british achievements okay <laughs> and he and he's like listing them all off or, or and all that and like towards the end he goes viagra <laughs> <laughs> and i'm just looking sick yeah <laughs> i was laughing yeah. at that i was laughing at it before the pandemic obviously now yeah. obviously he hates pfizer oh, of course well, except, except for you mate. yeah 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 that's very very good you and all like trusted that- them with your dick but yeah. you don't trust them with your life yeah nice yeah. And the lives of others as well, um, which is the other great part. And having that thing where um, that Rob Roos guy in the um, in the European Parliament putting it to Pfizer exec about transmission, and they basically said, "Yeah, we didn't test for transmission," which apparently means that it doesn't lower transmission. And like rational people believe this because basically they mm. they buy the line that someone admitted that it doesn't interfere with transmission and. Because people who were vaccinated were getting the disease, then yeah, okay, like, you know, apparently it doesn't lower transmission, which is insane. Of course it fucking lowers transmission. It lowers your chance of getting it and it lowers the severity and it lowers the duration. That all translates to lower transmission. It's just that scientific rigor, which is one of the things that anti-vaxxers both detest and also cry for when it's convenient (laughs) means that a transmission test is really expensive and really hard to do. And because pharmaceutical companies are for profit, and all their vaccines were approved without it, they haven't had to do it. And if you think a fucking vaccine, like a pharmaceutical company is going to spend money they don't have to spend, they are not going to spend money that they don't have to. That's just capitalism, bro. Yep. So, and look, yep. I don't think Capitalism, not, a com- not conspiracy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's fucking ridiculous. I mean, like, you know, when it comes to big pharma, I can see why Americans be pilled on this because if you watch American television, it's just constant fucking ads for pharmaceuticals. And they're so cool. And they've yeah. got the side effects list at the end, which they should have. And it's a regulatory mm-hmm. thing. And, you know, they say it really quickly. And you'll have like old people holding hands walking down a beach and be like, may cause, you know, shitting blood and kidney failure and, you know, death uh, to everyone around you and spontaneous combustion. And they're like, you know, dancing in a field and like, riding fucking horses. But I can see why you'd be very skeptical of um of something like that but then again like you know they love to go back to things like the tuskegee experiment which was really fucked up and that was that was more of a u.s government trick thalidomide yeah. was bad i mean thalidomide was really bad you know oh yeah people were born disfigured and, and that that's it i mean like your life sucks and what was a morning sickness but then they changed right? it well, they yeah, didn't of course. know. They didn't know that's what was going to happen, and then that's what happened. And they're like, "Uh, yeah, we're going to change this. We don't want to do this." Like that's yeah. what kind of happens. Not with the Tuskegee experiment, obviously. Yeah, that's that like a bad. completely freaking different thing. Yeah. But this is something that annoys me, right? Conspiracy theorists always bring up Tuskegee experiment, and yep. there was no conspiracy theory about it. Yeah. So this is my point. You got to have a conspiracy theory about a thing, then that is proven to be correct. There was no conspiracy theories about tuskegee and yeah. most of the time they get it wrong they don't even know what actually happened there yeah yeah you it's know? just a blanket a lot this of the time bad. they go are they 
they gave everybody syphilis. No, they didn't. No, they, were like, they just they 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 gave some, but they also just brought people who had it all in there and was just like, let's see what it's like see if it happens. runs wild. Yeah, let's not treat it. Yeah, you know, and it is so uh, it is terrible. Obviously, it's fucked what they did. Oh, absolutely. You know, this is this is again people trying to make money. Yeah, exactly. You know, and and use at it, the end use of the day, people back then were were bastards to to black people. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Total, total fucking bastards to black people. Yeah. Like, some of them still are today. And it's funny with some of these guys who speak of this experiment with this sort of like, you know, oh, how horrible it was. And I'm like, maybe you're like a Nazi. Like, you want to put these people in camps and kill them. So, like, you know, I'm sorry if I'm sort of doubting your anti-racism chops, but like, you know, the swastika just really sort of seems like a dead giveaway that you don't actually care <laughs> about these people. But anyway, whatever. So, yeah, like uh, – so there are definitely like, you know, these sort of the, these horrific things, uh, thalidomide, Vioxx, um, Merck released, I think it was a painkiller that gave people heart attacks or something. There was a swine flu vax. There's a whole thing around that. There were a lot of like, you know, sort of unintended side effects and stuff. And they rolled that out very quickly, very similar to the sort of COVID thing. And that's the thing with the thalidomide. Like, you know, they did, they withdrew it. They, and then they went, fuck, 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 fuck. But untold damage was caused. And they used that parallel to say, you know, but thalidomide. And it's like, yeah, but. Like you say, we learned things from that. And after yeah. that, they changed things because they went, oh, no, we can't let that happen again. But that's not convenient for the narrative. And what's scary about improving safety standards? There's nothing scary about that. We've got to keep the punters terrified. So They also, you know, they pulled AstraZeneca. Yeah, exactly. And well, a handful like, of people died. As soon as they found out, yeah, gone. Yeah. like <laughs> So we're going to continue with it, the mRNA instead. Yeah, which... Like, you know, they do, do act right. upon like bad shit happening. So, and very strangely, <laughs> what are you guys as well? talking about? And it fucking sucks because some of the deaths um, that happened there, like you know, young people who were just basically just robbed of their lives as a result of this, you know, sort of rushed vaccine. And fair enough. I mean, the outrage on that is fine, but conspiracy theorists can't just mourn the death of a handful of people and genuinely feel empathy for their for their you know their their loss. They have to make it about. No, 10 million people are dying and, oh, no, there's yeah. dead people in the street, but it's all covered up. No, a handful of people died and that's still a tragedy. You're allowed to be sad about that. It doesn't have to be a fantastic high number of deaths to get your endorphins running so you can have your little fucking weird high horse moment. You can be sad about a few people dying. You're allowed to do that. Give yourself the space to care about fellow human beings, if you like, not just statistics. 100%. But the other thing that I want to go to very quickly as a little thing, did you ever get into the germ theory, terrain theory territory? Disease? Not at all. No? Not at all. Interesting. That's no, I didn't, I didn't have to look into it that much, to be honest. I, like, at the end of the day, mate, I'm not, like a, I'm not big on like biology science. I like, like yeah, space okay. science. Yeah, that's you know, that it. That was what yeah, I was fair. always kind of into. Yeah, but just not really into. into... And lots of people like to talk about it, but I always kind of say, look, I'm not the science guy. I'm yeah. the ex conspiracy guy. Like, I'll talk about the, the, the crazy conspiracies around these things, but I'm not going to yeah. sit here and debate the scientific minutia with you. Like, yeah. there's experts here on all these social media sites. Go talk to them. Yeah, yeah, that's you that's know, totally I, fair. I mean, terrain theory is pretty funny because, like, when it comes down to it, germs do cause disease, and the idea that they don't is hilarious. But, um, but I, I think I got like a little bit sort of side pilled on that, but I didn't really articulate it well. Which is basically that a lot of diseases weren't what we thought they were, and they were environmental, whether it be chemtrails or you know, like like I said, the depopulation program, mm. various things that are coming into into play. And then you know, you say, oh, well, I've got this this illness, but realistically, you're sort of being poisoned. But I never really bothered to articulate it like a lot of people are doing now, basically saying, you know, germs don't cause disease, it's your environment. And uh, and I think it's just another way to basically sell crystals, to be honest. Um, you know, yeah. it's just it's just it ends up being a fucking sales pitch for an MLM. Every every time. Yeah, it just ends yeah, there's always a money trail. And the irony of like, you know, follow the money being such a big trope for conspiracy <laughs> theorists, and yet they never follow the money. Follow the money, guys. Hey. They're fleecing you because you're rubes. Notice how the, all the crypto scammers go onto Telegram. Notice how all the crypto scammers are in the comment section of right wing fucking threads. Yeah, that's not a coincidence. It's because you guys are easy fucking marks. Maybe you should like think about why that is and maybe reconsider your political allegiances just as a result of the fact that if scammers think you're gullible, maybe you are. Just 
just saying, you know, if you've been singled out as a as a fucking easy mark. But the next one, chemtrails. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Again, I had different views about this at different times. Interesting. So uh, first, obviously, you kind of go into the whole, yeah, they're, they're spraying poisons on us. Yep. You know, it's part of the soft kill. It's part yep. of the depopulation plan. Yep. Um, part of the the plans to subdue us, yep. like fluoride. Yep, yep. But then I kind of change a bit. Okay. And I'm, because I'm, I'm, I'm pretty cooked, <laughs> as you would say. <laughs> um. <laughs> I thought that the chemtrails were in play with HARP. Yeah, yeah, okay. So weather manipulation and shit. And that basically they were kind of pumping out mind control. Oh, that, like, okay, kind of yep, yep. Keep us all, again, subdued, but it MK was Ultra, through like basically. this. Yeah, but it was yeah. through like the, through the waves, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And then I kind of thought maybe that's a bit bullshit. Oh wow, you know, too far. Maybe that we don't we don't really need all that. Yeah, okay. So it's Scale it's to back. do with the um it's to do with changing the weather. Mm-hmm. You know, it's to do with yep. ge- geoengineering. Yep. Or classic. <laughs> me and my partner used to say like they used to just make it rain so that we'd be upset. So that we'd be <laughs> depressed so all the time. So the Brits would be miserable. You know? That's a good policy. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. that's what kind of we kind of went with. What a bastard you'd have to be. Because we'd watch. We'd watch chemtrails like you know, get come across the sky and then yeah. we'd watch clouds form around them and we could time it and be like, it's going to rain in an hour. Yeah. Or whatever. yeah, yeah. And we'd see it every single time. Pretty fucking safe bet to say it's going to rain in an hour in the UK. <laughs> That's like, <laughs> <flip a coin. laughs> has it rained for half an hour yet? Nope. Yeah. It's going to rain in an hour. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's it. <laughs> and, and then, yeah, I, you know, I kind of thought to push it further with the weather manipulation and everything that yeah. basically they were, hoaxing climate change yeah through this. Okay. yeah so yeah. all of the climate change stuff that we were seeing or whatever was actually them hoaxing it to sell us the climate change scam yeah yeah yeah. and that's so kind of that was kind of towards the end that's that's pretty much where i was kind of i had left it before i now know like yeah it's just um it's just contrails. It actually yeah. is contrails. <laughs> yeah, it is. And the thing that's interesting, I find, um, and this is very anecdotal, but I've found that when I'm in the UK, I'm assuming this is also due to the fact that you just have like a lot more flights, in, you know, coming in and out of London and um, and places like that, Oxford, stuff like that. Just the play- I've spent a fair bit of time over in England. And um, generally speaking, you guys have a shitload of contrails. And I'm guessing maybe the air is colder. Um, I'm usually there in some of those, so maybe that theory is bullshit. I don't know. But what I can say is, is that if there's more flights or it's colder air or whatever, you guys have a shitload more contrails, so therefore a lot more reasons to be terrified than we do here. Yeah. Um, but of course, you know, we'll have people in the Northern Rivers area, which is just sort of north of me, um, a traditional sort of cooked place, and they have the sort of contrails from flights going from further north down further south, and they'll just sort of fly over. And there'll be a few of them, but they'll have these big open skies, a couple of, couple of contrails there. In Sydney very rarely look up and see a big old trail every now and then. So one theory would also be that we're not being poisoned in Sydney because this is where the elites are uh, and they do it, you know, sort of only to these sort of regional areas to sort of fuck with them. But being in London and sort of looking up and being like, wow, they are busy at work here. I can see where that sort of like that paranoia because it's so um, tangible and visceral. You can look up and you can see it. And like you say, you can, Tommy, watch to it. Oh, you know, it's going to rain because the the contrails are there. It's like maybe in situations yeah. where there's more vapor in the air up there, the contrails might form more solidly. There might be a scientific explanation for this. But what's what a scientific? Ah, oh, fuck scientific explanations. I've got a theory, and it's more fun, and it's easy. <laughs> you know. And the thing is, like we said, we could watch it happen in front of our eyes. Yeah, yeah, that's and, exactly and, it. And, and well, you can't tell me that I'm wrong because I can fucking see it. Exactly. What are you, what are you talking about? Yeah, it's right there. Come Classic. sit with me for like two hours and let's watch this happen. Yeah, I'll show you. I'll show you this happens. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and I, it's it's very convincing like that because you know I saw it with my own eyes. It's just that what you saw with your own eyes was then tainted with this absurd narrative that you either made up or you heard or you read in a PDF that you got off Direct Connect or you know whatever. 
But yeah. one of the things that's interesting is the whole sort of cloud seeding thing. And for any listeners who don't know about cloud seeding, it does exist. It is real. It can, it's a way of basically making clouds come down. So if you've got a cloudy sky and you've got thirsty plants and you want those clouds to not just blow over and rain yet again on a coastal town that doesn't fucking need it and will bitch about it, you can send up planes to put whatever the fuck they put up there, silver particles, I think it is, something like that. And the clouds will decide, oh, actually, no, I think this is a good place to come down and it'll rain. Yeah. And that's fine. You can't make a flood happen. It just provokes, provokes, it provokes the, the cloud. Yeah. You know, and, and the thing is, is like those are done with like crop dusting planes. Yeah. Not with passenger jets. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Um, and uh, and the fact that, of course, passenger jets have passengers on them. So, um, you know, where, where are the chemicals? I guess they're <laughs> in the back. But, um, but yeah, like, you know, that is uh, – it, it is definitely a thing. But, like, you know, for example, I think in Australia, maybe like in Tasmania or somewhere, they had a flood and they had an inquiry into the fact that there was cloud seeding beforehand. And it was just incompetence. But even then, like, you know, the, the cloud seeding didn't have a material impact on the flood because generally speaking, if there's a flood, it's going to happen anyway. So your cloud seeding doesn't really add too many millimetres to the pile. You're already kind of fucked. Um but look, you know, when it comes down to it, with weather manipulation, I would kind of welcome it um, insofar as natural disasters are shit. No one's had their house flooded and gone, oh, man, I'm so glad we didn't interfere with that. Oh, imagine if we interfered with that flood and we stopped it from happening. Man, my house would not be flooded. What a tragedy that would be. Oh, man, the government really needs to keep the fuck out of weather. No, go ahead. If you want to stop a flood. Be my fucking guest. But, of course, nothing can be done altruistically. It always has to be nefarious. So Yeah, it has to be the other side, other yeah. way around, doesn't it? It has to be that they, like I thought, the Sumatra tsunami was them. Yeah. yeah. It was harp. Like they had had caused the earthquake under the ocean. And With a nuke, I think it was. The, yeah, well, like, I thought it was harp. Yeah, okay. Them. I think the, the, the theory that was going around when it came to the um, – the Indonesian uh, tsunami situation, which was very close to home here and like quite a big deal. Uh, and it was fucking awful. So many people died in Thailand, all, all over Fuck Asia. It is but mad, mate. It was oh really, really bad. And that was meant to be an under, underground nuke that created the earthquake. That was yeah. what the, um, the general sort of vibe I thought, was. I thought yeah. most, of these, most of these things were Hurricane Katrina. Like yeah. m- most of the really, really uh, big ones basically was them. They they controlled it. They got the weather manipulation stuff. Like you said, they can't ever like stop a flood, can they? They no, have to cause them. They have to cause it. Yeah. It's you always can't. nefarious intent. Yeah. Yeah. It's very sad. Living in that world sucks. It'd be very stressful. Well, moving on to one of my absolute favorites, fluoride in the tap water. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Definitely thought that was a thing. Your tap water sucks. Hey, yeah. Your tap water is so hard and awful. Sydney tap water, fucking incredible. So good. <laughs> we don't have all that gummy calcium shit on our taps because we don't have lime and chud in the water. Um, our water kicks us. Uh, so I can see why people in the UK might be a bit, you know, looking at their taps and being like, oh, well, that can't be good. But we don't have fluoride. Really? Really? Boring. Most Bo- count most counties in England do not have fluoride. Bristol Bristol water here. We don't have fluoride in the water. Interesting. Interesting. And I didn't know that. Like, I didn't know that when I was a truther. I thought it was in all the water. <laughs> <laughs> no matter what. That's so I thought they were just putting it in everyone's water. Yeah, didn't even yeah, have to didn't it. even bother checking that no, we don't actually do it in our country. <laughs> it's no. American. It's a big American thing. But obviously yeah. they always sold it as like Hitler put it in the concentration camps yeah. to subdue the 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 prisoners there and da da da. It's a neurotoxin. And so that's what they're doing to us. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, which which at the end of the day, fluoride isn't fluor fluoridate is, isn't it? Well, fluoride basically like sodium fluoride or whatever it is. You don't want to have a lot of it because you will die. But uh, the other thing that I find sort of suspect about it is that when it comes to fluoride in the water, and I believe we have it in New South Wales where I live, and not in Queensland. I think there are some local areas, like you say, with counties. I think some councils do it somehow. There's a whole legislative thing around it because it's all run by um by government law, basically, Um, whether there's, you know, sort of mandates of fluoride or options of fluoride and blah, blah, blah. And to be honest, I haven't looked into it. Um, We're doing this very off the cuff. It's not like a, you know, research episode. But when it comes down to it- Yeah, you didn't do this disclaimer, actually. Yeah, I was going to put a disclaimer disclaimer at the top of the episode. Basically, what we're saying here 
may very well not be true because usually when we do podcasts, we research them meticulously and we read off something that has these facts in front of us to make sure we don't say things that are wrong. But I figured that we didn't really have to do that because we're actually probably mostly reporting on bullshit here. So if we're talking about conspiracy theories, A, we might get the conspiracy theories wrong, but we're talking about our experience. Fuck you. And B, we may get other things wrong because this hasn't been meticulously fact-checked. I'm sorry. Take this episode with a grain of salt. That is the disclaimer because (laughs) usually I'm so anal at fact-checking. I'll be listening back and editing an episode and I'll go, hold on. And then I'll go and double-check it. I'm like, oh, fuck. No, I'm going to have to edit that bit out. That's not (laughs) true. That was one of those things I set off the cuff and I was wrong about. No, this is not a debunk. This is not a debunk episode. This is a conversation between two people who used to be down the rabbit hole and are now going to be joining together to to do the debunk deep dives. And try and basically save a few souls from uh, spending a lot of money on bottled water when they really don't need to because it's just not necessary. (laughs) But yeah, like the fluoride thing, right? So topical treatment, like, you know, with toothpaste, I used to buy fluoride-free toothpaste because I was very fluoride-pilled. Um, and they have like sort of that herbal toothpaste you can get like on the bottom shelf of the aisle, uh, twice the price and um, tastes like shit. But it got to the point where – because I was also drinking a lot of bottled water and I like sparkling water. I have a soda stream now. That's great. Um, but, you know, I still do drink bottled water insofar as I love the crack of a fresh plastic bottle of, um, of sparkling water. And, yes, that makes me bad for the environment, but fuck it, we have our guilty pleasures. But at the end of the day, topical treatment of fluoride is meant to be good. You put it on your teeth, (laughs) it somehow soaks in, it does something toothy. I don't fucking know. I'm not a dentist. But when it comes to drinking fluoride, it seems like the jury's kind of out on whether it really does anything. And to be honest, people in Queensland, their teeth are fine, I think. I don't know. So you could do your own research on this and you can sort of look into it, listeners, because I don't really know whether the effect of fluoride is there. But I would say that I am semi-fluoride pilled still not so far as this nefarious but more of just like a sort of bumbling tradition of incompetence insofar as they put fluoride in the water based on some sort of whim because like one of the things one of the theories is that fluoride is a byproduct of some sort of industry and this is how they dispose of it in the in the tap water um yes that's it yeah and it's so fucking vague. Like, what industry? Like, what? Like, why aren't they just like dumping it somewhere in like a you know like a lake, like any good capitalist would? Um, so I don't know. Like, it's all really, really vague. They got to get rid of it, so they're going to put like tiny, 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 tiny little tiny doses limits, yeah. inside your water, in, in and the they're trying to get like, rid of all of this amount of it. That doesn't, doesn't feel make efficient. Sense. Why don't? Yeah. No. Make it just make bury sense. It. Just bury it like a dog buries a bone. <laughs> I just I don't anyway. But, um, Put it in but, yeah. bombs, blow people up with it, do something. Yeah, if it's so bad, you know, sort of, you know, uh, spray it on, uh, you know, enemy territory. Uh, you know, that's a whole other story, I suppose. But, yeah, when it comes down to it, I don't know whether fluoride in the water has a beneficial effect uh, and I don't know whether it's got a harmful effect. And I'm a bit jury's out on that one still. I shrug my shoulders on that one a bit. Just I'm not, I'm not there. But I do not think that it is a conspiracy by them um, probably triple parentheses on that one to dumb us down, make us placated, uh, make us pliable, all that sort of stuff. That's that's fucking dumb. Yeah. Um, that's just not no, no, no. But I did believe that up until real yeah. fucking recent. Like I'm talking just before the pandemic, <laughs> when the Liz, my partner, she's like, you know, did you believe that when we got together? I'm like, oh. There could be some overlap, just a little bit of overlap, not a lot, but like there could be some overlap to when I started just being like, you know what, maybe the problem was I started drinking tap water and just stopped caring about the fluoride in the water because of the neurotoxin making me pliable and and dopey. The next one is a fucking absolute uh, corker for you and corker for me personally, actually, the 7-7 bombings. That surely that fucked you up. Proper, mate. Proper, proper. I was, I was, again, I was like, witnessing it in real time yeah i yeah. was on the computer in the morning i was on the david ike forum yeah like it was 9 30 or something in the morning i think when it starts mm-hmm. and i was up at like eight or seven or whatever and i was just doing my research talking to my friends and yeah. all that sort of yeah. stuff and i had the news on i'd always have i used to always have the news on anyway just like to kind of just keep an eye on yeah. what, what they were up to <laughs> and then uh yeah power outage in london yep the minute they said power outage in london the forum started going mad yeah and we're like something yeah. is happening something's up something is happening everybody pick a channel pick a radio station put it on in the background and 
just mark down everything that you can. Interesting. And through that entire day, as it became known that it was a terrorist attack, we were taking down yep. everything. We were we we were recording the Peter Power um, interview. We like we got everything that became the, the conspiracy in that like first week, and all compiled it together as a group on the David yeah, Forum. Okay. Wow, like really, um, because we were right there, man. Very participatory. I was right there, because like I said, yeah, yeah, nine eleven. You know, that was that was the U.S. government killing three thousand of their citizens. This was London. This was them yeah. doing it yeah. here to our Home citizens, turf, yeah. to my brothers and sisters. Different. Yep, hundred percent. We are not going to let them get away with it. We're going to watch every fucking thing that happens, and we're gonna have we're gonna expose them and keep an eye on these motherfuckers. Yeah. yeah, 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 that's it. How interesting. So that really was participatory for you. Big time. Very much so. How interesting. So the theory that I remember being going around the traps initially outside of the whole like, you know, sort of mainstream narrative was that there was a training exercise on at the same time and they got these poor hapless Muslim kids to go with these backpacks and they were meant to be doing a training drill but it turned out to be real and when they realized that like the other bombs had gone off, they freaked out. And like, you know, tried to pull out and whatever, but the powers that they had the whole thing planned so well and no one, no whistleblowers or anything, you know, it's just, there's it great theory. I mean, so it's, it's just a classic false flag. That's my, that was my theory. That's exactly what I thought. That's exactly yeah. what I thought. Yeah. That's sort of what I went with. Yeah. I, I thought that these kids had been set up. Um, they were patsies. Yep. They'd been asked to go along yep. with this training exercise and, um, yeah, like you said, the, the the guy who ended up blowing up the bus, um, Hasib Hussein, I think his name was, like he was the one who didn't yep. get on a train and yep. went to went yep, to Burger to King, allegedly, and tried to phone okay, somebody and then ended up getting on the bus and blowing himself up outside of Tavistock, uh, the Tavistock Institute, yep. on a bus that said, terror, bold and brilliant, because it was for a mo- for a it was an advertisement for the movie The Descent, which is a bunch of crazy, like, like a horror movie in in the subway, in the underground. Okay. Wow. And it was like That's, terror, bold and brilliant. That is quite something. Because I had it in a lyric. Let me try and find my lyrics, Jeez. man. Let me try and find this. This will be fun. Do it. Do it. Pledge no allegiance to the Prime Minister's speeches. I'm waiting for the day that Shuri reaches for the Kleenex to dry her eyes because she's heard the news that her hubby's died in a satanic ritual homicide found in the fens, not a garment in sight. Ooh. He was hog tied with a silver knife lodged in his spine. Finally, she finds a taste of what it feels like because Iraqi women live in this way every night. Imagine leaving even your sister, mother, or wife on a hot July in a pitch black tunnel. You're dying on the tracks and breathing becomes a struggle. Meanwhile, the lies break out 10 feet above you. BBC News 24 reports a power outage has interrupted London's transport. I highly doubt it. Yo, I've seen it before. Besides, I hear the carnage resonating through my core. It's Masonic law, totalitarian tiptoe. Order out of chaos, squeeze us tight, let us go. You give us a fright and then pretend to be a hero, but lift that facade. It's emperor nero right compassion is zero there's nothing left to talk about this is war ac told me i should knock you out if i saw you out i'd grab my sword gilded by the word of the lord and i would sort you out because bin laden did not blow up london it was you tony tell the truth it was blair who gave the order nmi5 conducted the slaughter Wow. They say that terrorism has got a place in Islam. I say they're brainwashing you and morally wrong. It may be true that some imams have placed their faith in hate, but why listen to what a snake has to say? Save your breath for the last Oof. days, because they've sold their souls and hence sealed their fate. They framed Sid, Shazad, Hasib, and Jermaine, and on Remembrance Day, they only read out 52 names. It's time for a change, and a change gonna come. You gunned an innocent man down when he did not run. One down, three to go, set the cover of the sun, but they print government lies without a question and nobody seems to stress them when they mention how the terrorism bill grants three months detention and they don't need a judge or any evidence and that's why there's no justice for sean charles de menena says interest wow there's so much in, in there damn that yeah like but you- even back then man i was saying they framed such as that hasib and jermaine and on remembrance day only read out 52 names yep yeah, because they were victims yeah, as well. That's how I felt. And there's a real, um, there's a real anti-racist sort of um, sentiment under there, which I really quite liked. It's that thing of like, you know, don't make this about fucking yeah. Muslims. It's about fucking Tony Blair and MI5. They're the yeah. snakes. It's not 
It's not this like, you know, Sunni extremism. Sure, some of these guys are a bit fucking baked, but let's not make it about that. That was nice. I like that. That was, um, that was a lot. <laughs> there was a lot of messages in there. I'm trying to keep up with all the things I'm like trying to like, you know, because I'm like expanding them in my head. Yeah, look, when it came down to the day, one of the things I can really resonate with you on that is, as you said, like it's our brothers and sisters in London. Of course, I'm Australian, but I was in London at the time. And the way I found out about the power surge is because I was walking down toward the platform at King's Cross Station and I was told by someone walking up I was walking down into the station, yeah. like it's like 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 a driveway type thing, um, and some lady came out going, "Power surge, power surge, trains are out," and I'm like, "Oh, okay. Well, I suppose I better get a bus." And that was the sort of extent of my experience, not having any idea of the fact there was a fucking train that had just blown up on the line, and I just went I, and I got a bus. And there was a lot of people getting buses, but I managed to just jump on a bus. What I was doing is I was going to Victoria Station to go to Oxford. And I had no idea it was happening. So I just basically just got on a tra- uh, on a bus to Victoria Station. The traffic was a bit fucked. Um, but I got there eventually. And I was going to get the bus from Victoria Coach Station to Oxford. And I'm sitting there waiting for the Oxford Tube to turn up, which is the bus that goes to Oxford. And everyone's phones stop working. And I'm like, why the fuck are the phones not working? This makes no sense to me whatsoever. So I jump on the bus and then someone on the bus, because this is like before smartphones and everything, someone on the bus had a fucking radio and they were like, and there were sirens everywhere though, like something was totally up. Um, and someone had a radio and they were like, there's been a bombing, there's been a bombing, blah, blah, blah. And that was the moment where that feeling of being attacked came in. They'd come after me. Yeah. And I was pissed off. And not only that, but it was Muslim extremists who came after me and tried to kill me. And I went only for a few, like for the span of like a few minutes, I went super racist. Fuck them. I was absolutely engulfed with fury and just personal rage. And then I basically got to Oxford. Very funny sort of situation because my dad saw the news and was like, oh, he's not up that early. (laughs) He's not going to be up that early. That's ridiculous. But my mum knew that I was going to Oxford because I was going to Oxford to go to the Horse of Uffington, which is my mother's astrology logo with one of her friends who lived in Didcot, who actually owned the big and tall um, stores in uh, in England. Um, I can't remember what it's called, but yeah. And uh, and yeah, we called off the, the trip to the horse because I was a bit shaken. And I found an internet cafe and got in touch with my father. And I was like, those fucking motherfuckers tried to kill me, those fucking cunts. <laughs> and he's like, calm down, calm down, calm down. They didn't come after you. There's no they, there's nothing here. And you also were miles away. You know how many people were involved in the explosion? Let's say a few hundred, right? And then- on the platform who heard a big bang, thousands. Then those who were closer to the platform than you, probably tens of thousands. We are getting into a huge amount of people who were personally attacked on the day who were walking down to a platform just like you were. You weren't blown up. They're not coming for you. This is a horrible tragedy. Stop fucking making this about you. (laughs) Stop being racist. And I'm like, shit, actually, that's quite a compelling argument. Um, yeah, and just talk me down off the ledge um, so effectively and so quickly. And I sort of took the day off after that. I sort of went, you know what? I think I just need to fucking have a beer. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but yeah, and then, of course, you know, the conspiracy theories about them being scapegoated, as you very fucking articulately expressed in your lyrics. But I didn't get to that point of empathy that you did. I didn't ever get to the point where they were victims. Um, and that's, I think that goes back to like my September 11 reasoning as well. When the people jumping out of the building were just pawns in a bigger game and that empathy wasn't there. And I found it very interesting during this conversation. I've never thought of this before. The fact that even with the seven, seven, when I was convinced that these people were patsies who were put up to it, a training exercise, basically just getting paid. And the reason why they got Muslims was because that was a part of the sort of the bar, the, yeah, bar, the war you know, on the, terror the dress that, rehearsal yeah. had to be fucking Muslims. Right. And, uh, and then they got stitched up and killed. But I never thought we should mourn their death. I never thought that we should be upset for them. Now I'm looking back, I feel like a prick. <laughs> you know, like, fuck, it's so obvious. Well, I had, a gr- I had a group of Muslim friends at the time. So it was, you know. Yeah, okay. I, I got to hear their side of it. Be like, yeah. 
I Most come from a very do white this, place. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Like, you know, like, yeah. yeah. And and that's, yeah. Like, I went to Pakistan um, several years ago and hung out with this girl named Adair and it was a really amazing time. We went to all these mountain places up north. Feder- federally administered tribal areas. These places are fucking hectic. There's, you know, death to Israel, death to America, spray painted on walls and stuff. We had the security agencies following us the whole time. And these are the places where the Taliban were coming because it was up near Afghanistan coming in and basically like you know shooting kids for going to school if they were girls that, stuff like that but I found it very difficult to reconcile when I was there because everyone was so fucking nice and it's not just that anecdotal niceness it's that, that genuine sense of befuddlement in the fact that there is this narrative around this Islamic extremism and terrorism and then there are these people where for example we were with an Italian girl this journalist and she was rather busty and she wore some shirts that I personally wouldn't have worn in a conservative area. And the guys, they weren't like angry at her. They weren't like, you know, throwing Molotov cocktails at her, but they were looking at her feet. They were not looking at her chest and they weren't even looking <laughs> at her eyes because there was a bit of tit, you know, in their peripheral. They were just looking at her fucking feet, just like, I am not, no Satan, not today, not going to look there. Damn it. Oh, and I'm just like, come on, man, fucking wrap up. Jesus Christ. But, um, but yeah, but anyway, yeah, that's the that's the Pakistan thing. But yeah, I was there for seven seven, and um, it made me very angry. But I've now realised that I lack empathy, and I'm going to work on that. I think that's a. I'm glad <laughs> this is. I feel like I'm, I'm advancing as a person. You know, I'm moving forward. Yeah. I so, come from a very um, multicultural background. Right. You know, mm. and have always been. I really don't. In very multicultural friend circles. Yeah. Because obviously, yeah. like, like I said, growing up in the military, like at the end yeah. of the day, the people who are in the military are minorities and poor people. And it's a melting pot as well. That's the people that sign up, you know, for active yeah. duty, essentially, not the ones that get to go to college and become officers straight away, but the actual yep. the NCOs and everything. Not your Ron um, DeSantis types. My first stepdad. He was a Puerto Rican from the Bronx. Yeah, okay. Yeah, Ramon, yeah. You know, so I, that's where I was introduced to hip-hop. Yeah, interesting. At a very, very early age. As a little, little boy, I had a little red tape that had like Run DMC and people like that on it, and he had given it to me. Oh, you know, So okay. I was well into hip-hop ever since then. And then my my second stepdad was black, and we've got four black um, sisters yeah, you know, so it's yeah. just always been very, very multicultural and interesting. Been been mixed essentially. So it I've shaped had you well. Friends from different, yeah. I'm a white well boy who got into metal. You know, it's <laughs> completely different. My story is way less interesting. Fucking, I think I that's why a- we had a, a reggae metal hip hop band. Yeah. <laughs> I have to listen to that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get some reactions. I'll, I'll send you some demos. I'll send you yeah. some demos. Do it, do it. They're so, terrible because <laughs> they're only live gig ones, and we were all fucked. Ah, <laughs> uh, that's all right. You know, I'll listen. I'll listen to them in the car. But there's some heavy shit in there, man. Well, look, you. Know, I, I basically, if it's heavy, I'm, I'm one of those people like when people say, "Oh, I like all music." It's such a cop out and dumb thing. But when it comes to metal, very rarely can I listen to metal and be like, "I didn't enjoy that." If it's just a, a big old cranky loud thing, I'm just like, yeah. Yeah, I'm happy here. This is fine, but uh, you know, to varying degrees of enthusiasm, of course. But um, but if it's if it's metal, I'm just generally speaking going to be feeling quite at home, which is I don't know, weird. Probably speaks to some sort of weird masculine issue that I have. Fuck knows what. <laughs> speaking of masculine issues, this it's a terrible segue. Nine eleven. <laughs> Let's talk about nine eleven because it's the elephant in the room. Um, it's the plain sized elephant in the room. Uh, we talked about er- earlier before though. We, we've given nine eleven a pretty good crack because let's face it, it's the uh, it's the conspiracy of conspiracies. Well, it is for our generation at least. Yeah, it's definitely the gate. It's the gateway for a generation. Absolutely, it that's was it. for me. It was a huge gateway drug for me. Michael Moore was a part of that gateway drug, though. Like Fahrenheit nine eleven, um, yeah. the opposition to Bush, introducing the ideas of organizations like Carlyle, um, the big investment firm that has so many military ties to it through the bushes. Um, Halliburton, of course, Dick Cheney, that sort of thing. This stuff, um, but it was very leftist and very anti-capitalism. You know, the powers that be are the moneyed interests. They have investments in arms and that's why the Iraq war and the Afghanistan war as well. I never really got completely on board with the Afghanistan war because I thought it was the same sort of thing, just a money money maker. Um, but it was all, they're all linked and it was all happening. And of course, the, uh, the towers were demolished. Jet fuel does not melt steel beams, blah, blah, fucking blah. But I'm guessing you went 
fucking hardcore. Did you get ritualistic on this shit? Is there a pentagram in, in the World Trade Eventually. Center? Yeah. I bet you did. I bet yeah, you fucking eventually, did. Eventually, bro. <laughs> eventually, there was plenty of um, numbers and dates and stuff like that. Didn't they? They hit the Pentagon. They hit the yeah, Pentagon. Yeah, the Pentagon. Yeah. All right. The Pentagon. What's what? What is the Pentagon? It's the middle of a pentagram. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean, you so, got to go there, right? Yeah. There's there's tons there's tons of symbolic stuff in there. Um, yeah, I which all mean there. bollocks. All means nothing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, at, the the, at the end of the day, it really does mean nothing. It's just numbers. Yeah, yeah. Very not red pilled over nine eleven anymore. I yeah. am still. Um, there's still some questions to be answered about possibly who knew what, yeah. whether or not they yeah. let certain things happen. Totally but agree. I do think. Um, I think the real conspiracy here is obviously bin laden obviously al-qaeda but i yep. do think like they were aided and abetted by certain individuals in yeah. the pakistani intelligence and in yep. the saudi intelligence and yep. that's not to say that the saudis are behind it yep the individuals i'm talking about are sympathetic to saudi dissidents yep which is what osama was Yep. You know, yeah, he was sort he of ostracized wanted at that to, point. Yeah, they wanted the, the royal family to not be in charge because yeah, they don't okay. believe in royals when you're like a fundamentalist Yeah, because the only king is God, I suppose. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so he yeah. looked at like the, the Saudis, the, the house of Saud, as like the house of Satan. False prophets? Yeah, yeah. okay. And yeah, interesting. Real um, fundamentalist Muslims in, in Saudi – and in Pakistan, you know, are sympathetic to that. Interesting. And, and probably helped along the way. And I think that's where maybe the real conspiracy lies, but not necessarily within like Bush did it and it was an inside job kind of thing. But I think there's no. still questions to be asked. There's still things to be found, but no controlled demolitions. Um, yep. It was a plane that hit the Pentagon. Yep. A plane crashed in Shanksville. Four yep. planes were hijacked by yep. 19 men. And yep. That part of the official story is completely yeah. true. Like, yeah, okay, right? that's that's yeah. where I'm at today, and I can argue that all day. I can I can argue that all. I do, I do argue that yeah. all day. On, you you on probably X. do. Yeah, yeah. What about NORAD <laughs> not shooting down the planes? Yeah, well, that was a really interesting one. Um, yeah, I, I got pretty pilled on that. That key point. It sounds good on surface, doesn't it? But do you know what this? It's pretty hard to pull the trigger on shooting down a fucking passenger plane. Yeah, but do you know what the um, exercise was? Ah, uh, yeah. What you know how they said that there was an exercise there that was they exercise at the same time. had been planning that morning or whatever. Yeah, um, same as it was. Seven seven. Yeah, that exercise that NORAD was working on was about a passenger plane that runs out of fuel oh. and crashes into a military base oh. because of it. Okay. Now, that's what they were that was the the war game they were playing that day what would they do in that situation interesting yeah and when like they found out that this had happened that's why they're like is this real world or exercise because he was yeah. confused He's like, that's not what the exercise is supposed to be yeah okay so there was a bit and of a, like you as know, soon as they found out it was confusion. real world they switched they switched yeah, into okay. real time right something Scramble else jets. is going down what do we do you know yeah fuck interesting yeah there's things that we didn't know we didn't yeah. know this back in the day because they leave these little tiny details out for some reason. It's almost as yeah. if they're trying to yeah. uh, manipulate you by omitting things. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Isn't that just like, and it really is quite refreshing coming from that sort of background where you really believe in this sort of stuff. And then you get the sort of big picture and you do feel a sense of betrayal. You're like, hold on. Did you know um, this, you bastard? Because if you knew yes. this, then you fucking suck. If you didn't know this, then you're stupid and you shouldn't be presenting to an audience because you're not smart enough. But if you didn't know yep. about it, you're an idiot. And if you did know about it, you're a fucking liar. Either way, yep. report card, not positive. No, you know, <laughs> not great. Um, so, yeah, I just, yeah, it, it is, there's a sense of betrayal. But we've, we've sort of gone through the um, the real thing of like that sort of like the linchpin of this being um, going into Iraq, going into Afghanistan, all the profiteering, all the money making, all that sort of stuff. Bush being a fucking, you know, crony and all the conspiracies going back with the Bush family going back since forever, um, you know, all the way yeah. to Grandpa Prescott and all that sort of stuff. Um, but I think like, so when it comes to 9-11, of course, you know, 7-7 um, being, uh, being another thing, in between, but I've personally found that 
until the sort of QAnon space, which I only really found out about during the pandemic. I came very late to the QAnon party because I just wasn't paying attention. Did you get Q pilled at all or anything around that? Um, no, Q kind of, to be honest, I was on my way out. Yeah. Around then. Starting to reek of bullshit. Like Pizzagate happens. And I was also kind of like, yeah, I know that the satanic elite are pedophiles. Um, yeah. I don't think they're hiding it in these emails, though. I'm pretty sure they've got like the dark web and you know yeah. <laughs> encrypted yeah, messages and stupid. all that kind of yeah. shit. They're not. Yeah, they're not going to do that. I just and I didn't really didn't really go along with the Pizzagate thing, although I believed in it in essence of satanic pedophiles. You know, yeah, run the yeah, world yeah, yeah. essentially. That's it. Yeah. Yeah, the adrenochrome thing, hundred percent believed in all that stuff. Yeah, because, like, okay, David were... Icke was talking about that again. Like, yeah, like I never got there. Ago, there was a adre- the blood was adrenalized when you would um, torture someone and then yeah. sacrifice them and all that kind of thing. Yeah. yeah, we we was like well into that. Most of the things that like Q and honors believe, like I believed yeah. before them. It, yeah. The only thing, the only thing I wouldn't have believed in is the good guy, the good guy in Trump, the yeah, good guy okay. in this yeah. this good Illuminati trying to fight yeah. the deep state or something like that. Like that was just the to good me, that politician was bullshit. Yeah, you know, there's no chance. And at that point, I was like, yeah, this is a psyop. Yeah. Hundred yeah. percent. This is a psyop. These are the sort of things that sort of trigger you. Um. So I, I never really went down the queue whole yeah yeah i can definitely Um, like i can relate to that in so far as also when it comes to and i was like also like you like pretty much out at this point because i just sort of lost interest but when they started veering toward the right and becoming more religious um that's when i started switching off a bit but when it comes to the idea of trump being some kind of savior or something like that i'm even just like take it all back i'm just a partisan so, you know, like mm. I'm left of center, uh, you know, I'm more Democrat than Republican. And whenever like something happens where it's like, okay, the Republican's the hero of the story, my cognitive dissonance kicks in and I'm like, can't be. Republicans are bad. That's my <laughs> entire personality. Uh, you know, so like I can't, I can't process that. So, you know, once they started making it like a right wing partisan issue, you've, you've lost me because I'm a lefty and I'm, I'm not really sort of changing. Um, and that's yeah. not being smart. Or um, or using critical thinking or anything like that. It's just knee jerk, reactionary, polemic behavior. Um, and uh, I find it fascinating that a lot of these like sort of left wing types, like uh, my mother being a sort of active conspiracy theorist, really big on sort of Bill Gates and uh, all that sort of stuff. She found it very difficult toward the sort of like you know before the pandemic, but toward when we st- sort of sort of stopped talking to each other. Um, I saw her on social media sort of battling this whole thing of people coming out and saying that Trump was the savior, and she's like, "No, fuck Trump," and she's <laughs> she was struggling to maintain being a conspiracy theorist and a lefty because the whole conspiracy theory universe had been taken over with this bizarre enamorment for Trump, which turned out to be a QAnon yeah. based. Um, which I didn't really know about because I didn't really care, but I was watching her having these sort of battles being like, you don't need to be a Trump supporter to distrust them, you know, three brackets. Right. And, um, and I'm like, wow, okay, this is all getting real weird. I'm not, I'm not into this, but you know, but yeah. And then they got like mole children and stuff like that. That started really, really around 2015. Like the game rate. I think that's where it kind of starts to, the lines start to blur because literally from 2003 to 2015 like politics was never in like involved i i never saw it at least yeah like, i was always political in the political with... sphere everyone in the political sphere was practically part of it yeah you know, the left yeah, exactly, and the right yeah. the labor and conservative republican democrats all that kind of stuff flip side of the same coin they're they're all working for satan you yeah know? <laughs> it's all part yeah. of the power pyramid like yeah. so it, it just two wings of the same bird that's just what, yeah. what we were told over and over and over two wings and i believe yeah, they are they're not elected then you look back yeah and you look back though and those people that were saying that was anthony j hilder alex jones yeah people who yeah. have been like proper right-wing conservative john birch society yep. members yep like, yep, 100%. and I didn't even notice it, and that's how they were able to start slowly sneaking all their conservative, very, very right wing, yeah, right wing politics, points. and Republican, 
uh, basically turning conspiracy theories into Republican voters. Um, yeah. And, and yeah, and like it, it totally worked. One of the things with the, um, the political side of things is that from a fairly early age, probably about sort of like 2000 and sort of three or four, really four, probably I started hanging out in political circles with a mate of mine's dad and went to parliament in Canberra, um, got guest passes, um, went all throughout the house of representatives, um, when they were sitting and, you know, talking with politicians, going out to meals with politicians, getting to know politicians. I have politician friends, well, at least, you know, ex-politician friends, really. But, you know, I've I've got that sort of personal side to it. Similar with journalists as well. Like, you know, like I've, I know a lot of journalists. My sister's a journalist. I've got friends who are journos. My podcast co-host is a journo. So whenever there's these journalism conspiracy theories, you're sort of like, but these are these are my friends you fucking idiot like i know these people they're not there's no agenda like i know these people very closely one of them's my sister and she's not being paid by george soros to say what she says and no one's fucking controlling her agenda and if she is my god she's keeping it a fucking secret because she hasn't told Mm. me anything mate so you know i found it very difficult with the politics thing as well because i'm like i know these politicians they're not evil people and i you know i've been in their offices when they're making decisions and signing papers and addressing things and it's just not like i've seen the fuck i've seen the sausage getting made so i can't yeah, that's i can't thing. jump on board with this i hadn't i hadn't yeah. seen any of these things and i see them now like i've seen yeah. how like news works and media yeah. and like i'm yeah. friends with lots of journalists mainstream massive journalists yep and i yeah. see how these things are put together. I see, I do see the, I think manipulation is a bad word here, but okay. the framing of certain narratives. Yep. Yep. It does happen because yep. Fox News had the memos in the morning. Everyone, you know? everyone has an agenda. Everyone's yep. trying to tell what they think is the important information to give their audience. Exactly. You and know, they are you often get hired Fox and for that BBC. reason. Exactly. You get the Fox or the BBC or these other people, and they will tell you the 10 points out of 50 that yeah. happened that really like resonates with their audience. You know, we've yep. seen, we saw, yep. we've had a, a few, uh, we've had some coverage in the BBC, and we've seen how, yep. Like they don't necessarily tell our whole story because they ain't got time. At the end of the day, they, they don't, don't have time yeah. to tell us Word the whole limits, story. Time limits. So they yep. figure a way of telling a, a, a narrative, like the, or what the they most think important is the version of like my story, essentially. Yeah. You know, so yeah. I'm always like annoyed at like certain bits that get left out because I feel like, oh, that's real good context. It's really important. And you've yeah. kind of dropped it, but they didn't th- see it as that. Yeah. You know, but I, I've had it with i think yeah charlie hebdo like the charlie yeah. hebdo thing was 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 cool i like i've never been a big fan of charlie hebdo obviously because i'm like religious much, it's, but also yeah. yeah yeah exactly yeah yeah but you know the, the the journalist approached me and it was awesome and he was so funny and we had a really good time we had an awesome conversation yeah. Um. And he was like, "Dude, I'm making this whole article about you." Interesting. Like, they wanted me to get like three people on here, and I'm, I'm throwing them, throwing them all away. I yeah, want your I story. You it's just out. like yeah. amazing. He took it to the editor, and they're like, "No, no, we want two stories. Oh, really? We want a different. We want another one to counter it. Balance perspective. Yeah. So he had to cut so much out. Yeah. Yeah. Our national broadcasters so it similar. Wasn't they him. are obsessed yeah. with making sure they're balanced. Yeah. That's. It's so frustrating. And yeah, it's the editors. And they they have their own agenda, which is usually at least trying to appear to be some sort of balance, something like that, because they're a national broadcaster and they have charters they have to fit within and stuff like that. But it's, it's good that you've had this sort of experience with that sort of humanizing element of realizing that journos are people too. Um, so, Absolutely. you know, when, when Nuremberg 2.0 does happen and my podcast co-host is hung or hanged, I always say hung. That's uh, that's Hunter Biden is hung. People are hanged. That's that's why I got to remember it. Um, but uh, but you know when he is hanged, um, I'll feel really bad um, because I unfortunately know the truth that he's uh, he's a good bloke. Um, but he was asking for it um, by speaking out against the, uh, the the truth tellers of this world. Why why aren't you hanged as well? Oh, Hold I'm on, not a journalist. I'm supposed to be. I'm sweet. Nah, nah, you're fucked. Yeah, 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 yeah. But you you put your head above yeah. water, which is the problem. No, no, I'm, I'm yeah. maintaining. So far, 
no one has said that I should get the rope, which is cool. So I'm just taking that as a general green light. Um, and no one's really called me a journalist um, outside of myself when someone asked me about incels and they said, you know, what should we say you are? And I said journalist because I wanted to get a, uh, a spot on a show called Background Briefing and it's a whole other rabbit hole I'm not going to run down. But uh, yeah, other than that, me calling myself a journalist once in a Swedish publication, um, no. So enjoy the rope. <laughs> I've heard it sucks. Um, but I'm going to be watching on uh, TV or I'll go and watch it live because, you know, apparently that's what's going to happen. Come and cheer me on. Yeah, absolutely. I'll have a big sign saying, you know, I believe in you, whatever that means. <laughs> Let's just hope they have a short rope because remember, I'm six foot six. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, that is going to be challenging. Oh, don't worry. We'll, we'll make a special galaxy. We, oh my God, no. Oh, sorry, I said a quiet part out loud. Um, but yeah, so like, so that's the general sort of vibe. Like, you know, I, I think what we've tried to sort of express here is what the beliefs are and where they are and how it feels to sort of look back on them in hindsight and see that, okay, you know, we don't want to harp too much on about like, you know, we were wrong and now we're right sort of thing, but that is a miserable fucking place to exist. The idea that you're being slowly killed from above by a fucking gradual depopulation program, that's not fun. And you can't even take antidepressants because big farmers poisoning you. (laughs) So, you know, they make you sad and give you no solutions, um, which is really quite into the part into the part about the clothes that I wouldn't wear. Oh, let's have a look at that. The the, the products, the products okay, that I wouldn't got buy. Some, some boycotts. Yeah, for, for good reason or dumb reason. logo on it, mate. Really? Okay. Symbolism, right? Yeah, yeah. Look, last October is the first time, and it was a really big deal for me, all right, that I bought a Nike top. Interesting. Because I had like boycotted Nike the whole time I was – a truther. Yeah. Not because of the unethical sweatshop shops no, no, or God any of that sort of stuff. No, <laughs> no because there was a swoosh on it. Yep. And the swoosh on it was a sim- symbolic reference to Saturn. And Amazing. Because well, the rings think, around the planet. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. And if I if I died wearing that, my soul would be bound to Saturn. And would not go to heaven. Oh, that's a bit sad. If I had any of these like symbols, these occult symbols, like a five pointed star, I'm going straight to the devil. If any of these sorts of things happen, like that is like literally what I thought. Like, interesting. Um, it's like bacon. That these and were magic Muslims. symbols, and that they're kind of they're you're, you're marked. And again, why does it always go back to David Icke? Because it does. Okay, because um. Like he used to say that the soldiers that would die in the wars, they had like medals on or they had an a, a other insignia on. Yeah, so I wouldn't wear these as insignias or symbols of anything kind of a cult. Even the um, apple that you got behind you. Interesting. You know, the bit in apple, the bit in apple on the screen is Adam uh, sim- yeah, symbolic of tem- being tempted by the talking snake, which tempted again, by I didn't think that was... A- I did not think that was a talking snake because the word for serpent in in Genesis is nakash, N C H S H, and okay. that means shining one. Wow, Dave. Yeah, it can mean serpent. It can mean diviner, or it can yeah. mean the shining one. Interesting. So I always thought of that as like the shining one, the Illuminati. Oh like, wow! Because like the um, all seeing eye, the the, the thing Lucifer. And Lucifer yeah. as well, because he's supposed to be the brightest angel. Because okay. he's like adorned with lots and lots of jewelry. So yeah, that's, okay. that's who I thought it was. Never thought it was a talking snake. Always thought. Yeah, interesting. Like that's what that was. Interesting. But yeah, I, I wouldn't buy anything, mate. We wouldn't buy Christmas cards if they had five pointed stars on them. <laughs> oh, fuck. You try and buy a Christmas card without a fucking star on it. Oh, man, that's so intense. You just yeah. your life is just sort of um, guided by these continually changing symbolic rules. I tell and, you, the weirdest thing: uh, the stakes are so high. The weirdest thing is that you think that you're you're liberated by this knowledge. Oh my god, that's so true! Because you've seen the truth, right? Yeah, and I know oh. how to combat it, and I know how to not be like taken to Saturn. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but yeah. Now looking back at it, I see how oppressive it was on my entire life in 
everything that I did is the reason I didn't ever like seek to get signed because I didn't yeah. want to be owned by the mainstream. Yeah, like, yeah. and I could have been could have been with yeah. my band. I could have been when I was solo. There's plenty yeah. of opportunities where I could have got signed to a record label, and yeah. I didn't do it. Yeah, you didn't shoot your shot because I was going to say nope. I'm going fully independent. And, yeah, and it worked for a while. You know, I mean, I like the first year of doing my own hip hop stuff. I sold twenty thousand copies in a year. Fuck, that's not like, bad. All my own money, ten pounds a pop. Yeah, wow. For you know, like you know, I lived off that for a while. Yeah, I definitely held myself back because of all this stuff. I didn't get a mortgage. Yeah, um, me and my partner didn't try to have kids. Yeah, I, I didn't bother with, like I said, the career and getting signed or any of that stuff because. I didn't want to be locked into their slavery or anything, but re- yeah. not realizing I have become a slave in my own mind. Total. The irony of like Alex Jones' prison plumber. And I f- can totally see how oppressive it was. You know? Yeah. Yeah. It really is. You, you are. You're, you're a prisoner in your own sort of like, you know, of your own making. And I think it's interesting the fact that you, you've taken so many liberties with some of these theories, especially the sort of the Genesis and the Apple thing and stuff like that, where – not only have you sort of locked yourself into this I can't be bound to satin sort of thing, but you're not only just taking cues from David Icke and Jones and all these sort of mad people, but you're also making some of them up. You're, just, you're connect, connecting the dots yourself yeah. and then creating it just a, putting extra bars in the prison cell. How fucked. Yeah, totally. After a while, mate, I didn't need these people anymore. Yeah. You know, when me and my partner were together, like 2010, we got together. By 2011, 2012, we had stopped watching pretty much everyone. I, I mean, like to be fair, I thought at that point Alex Jones had been what, controlled possessed by a like, demon as well. Possessed by a demon? I, look, <laughs> no, just straight up possessed by a demon. To be yeah. honest, not disagreeing. I can't. I can't actually yeah. argue that point. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah, it's like. We didn't need these people anymore. We had gone a bit further. There's there's some people, um, influencers in the conspiracy world that I never mention their name because yeah, they okay. are toxic. like, oh, no, it's not even too toxic. It's that they have so much information, they will pill you. Yeah. Okay. And if you don't know how to combat that information, you will be pilled. Yeah. Yeah. There's certain names I do not mention, but these are the people yeah. that we were looking into. And because of that, we started writing our own blogs we started watching the events unfold ourselves and yeah, started and to decode everything yeah, decode yeah exactly. everything like if you go to yeah. um my if you go to my pin thread on x formerly yep. known as twitter yes, um, yes, yes. i have <laughs> i have uh my pin thread has like blogs on it my old yep. conspiracy blogs and you can yep. see me and my partner like break down like the royal wedding and uh, wow. the death of Osama and the Glastonbury festival and all these different things like us breaking down. Yeah, man. Fuck. Yeah, it's like the, the pyramid stage, right? Well, yeah. And and the people that designed the pyramid stage, right, were proper hippies. Yeah. And the guy who did it said that he got the vision in a dream. Okay. And that he was told in his dream to build a spiritual satellite to the stars uh, okay so when people would perform it would shoot up like wow. spiritual whatever into the and i took that as like proper evil essentially interesting um, i think um churchill's granddaughter was part of it and obviously he was a druid and just it was so wow. many connections like that it did make it seem like dark you know yeah, that's um, fascinating. It's just England, man. It's England and the rich history with Druidism. Yeah. That's what I can see it as now. That's it. It's yeah, that makes sense. Else. Not really something we sort of do here. <laughs> yeah, Springsteen, yeah. when he played dumb Glastonbury, I went uh, when Springsteen and Blur played. Blur was amazing. And Springsteen did like a real like long set with a lot of absolute b-sides which is probably not exactly the best thing for the glastomy crowd but he played very sort of uh, this very gospely song off his new thing and did this like evangelical thing i can't remember it well because i haven't seen like footage or anything i just remember it from the time and it's so funny like if i thought that the pyramid stage was in some way shape or form satanic and then i saw bruce springsteen doing this sermon like <laughs> performance oh man my brain yeah. would have gone to all sorts of fucking crazy places Luckily, I was just there, drunk on drunk on cider. 
we broke down the three headline acts like they each had their own blog because we were breaking them down like the cold play set the beyonce set and the u2 set and how they were all like tied into yeah they're satanic stuff <laughs> like i mean like u2 yeah yeah the band yeah. like there's yeah. a um sumerian demon called u2 interesting spelled u-t-u wow and there's like a point it. where, and he's a horned demon, right? And there's a point where <laughs> Bono's like rocking around the stage with his fingers on his head like this, like he's like oh, he's a bull no. running around and shit. And it's just all this stuff because we know all these different all things this about shit. You bring it together, history and all the stuff. Yeah, and so we're like, oh, that must mean this. Oh, that's a reference just to that. Piece it together. Oh, so you did you talk just, about the Stone Circle at all? Yeah, yeah. St- just talked about everything, man. Because the Stone Circle is where you got acid, where you got drugs. Stone Circle is where you go and you just ask around for yeah. drugs. I got um, fake acid there, which was very upsetting because um, I wanted real acid and it wasn't. But I did get some real acid there. Um, but I was feeling very uh, once bitten, twice shy about buying acid. I made sure it wasn't the same design. I'm like, oi, I got fake acid here. This is bullshit. And I think there's some ketamine <laughs> yeah. going around. Stone Circle was great. So, yeah, Satan's got good drugs but also bad drugs. So don't buy off Satan. Buy off the, the good people. But not not the satanic people at the Stone Circle who rip you off and take your take your pounds and don't give you acid, bastards. Well, on that cheery note, I think we've basically summed up the conspiracy universe in a couple of hours of what I would say is cracking content. That was a really good chat, man. Yeah, man, I enjoyed it. Yeah, it's, it's really late, good. But it's awesome. Yeah, I've, <laughs> I've got to go to fucking work, man. <laughs> <laughs> I got to go to bed. <laughs> let's let's sum this up by saying where people can find you and how they can find your excellent podcast, which they should absolutely listen to. I love it. It's it's great, and I learn shit from it. You know, like I, I do look into these things, blah blah. blah but um, when you guys do a deep dive on something, or even just the, the blog post, I'm like, fuck, I did not know that. It's constantly blowing my mind. Yeah, you can find me uh, on X. Yep. I have to say X. I have to get used to saying X. Yeah, like I'm going to be around the there for a while, now, so man. I have to say yeah. it. I got a blue yeah, tick, you know. Yeah. I got to say it. I got to play the game. Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> it. Yeah, and that's fine. Sometimes you yeah. got to play the game to play the game, right? Is what it is. Well, follow me on on X at Brentley S D C I C, and if you want the podcast, it's available absolutely everywhere. Some dare call it conspiracy, and yep. you can find us at some dare call it conspiracy dot com. Super Excellent. easy. Yeah, that's and perfect. you definitely want to start tuning in because our buddy Joel here is yeah. a new Some Dare member. It's gonna happen. It's gonna happen. And um, for the Some Dare listeners, uh, you can find me at uh, Crunchy Moses on X slash Twitter. Crunchy Moses is with a K. And to be honest, I'm search banned anyway, so I don't think you can find me. And I don't spend that much time on there, but. I also am on Facebook. If you look up the Conditional Release Program on Facebook, you will find us. And if you look up the Conditional Release Program on any podcast app, you will find us. Now, I must give a disclaimer. Some of our content is a little bit Australia-centric. So if you have an interest in the Antipodeans and how fucking weird we are, it might tickle your fancy. But sometimes you might press the skip button through some of our very niche Australian (laughs) content. But we do a lot of deep dives recently to the Sound of Freedom. And that's very uh, location neutral. So I think you'll get some joy out of that. So, uh, you know... Pick apart our back catalogue, have a bit of fun, and there's some really dumb shit in there. Really, really dumb shit because the pandemic was really, really dumb. It was really, really <laughs> dumb. <laughs> Just so much dumb shit. I like hearing about Australian stuff. Yeah, we're uh, we're funny. That's we're my bucket list. Bunch. That's where I want to move. I want to move to see you guys. I want to well, move man, to Australia. We'll happily take you. Uh, well, our immigration policies are pretty fucked, but uh, please do. I will facilitate this. I will put in a good word. <laughs> oh, thank you very much, listeners. Um, Some day, listeners, conditional release program listeners, we love you all in equal parts and look forward to um, talking shit to you in the future. Thanks, guys. Peace. Much love. Many blessings.